evening and welcome to Too bad. episode 18 of tomorrow's world audit time good evening mark Good evening, Russ. How are you? Well, feeling quite proud, Mark. I think you were um, smug the... last episode. So this is yeah, time no, you're yeah, proud. No, yeah, I'm proud this episode because we are the parents of a wonderful 18 year old podcast. It's just turned 18, hasn't it? It, has, that means, yeah. uh, it means it can well, it can buy jazz mags in the uh, in the news agents. You can buy booze in the off license, and most importantly, mm. and most saliently for this episode, mm. it can vote. It can vote. Yes. Yeah, so today is in real life is. Thursday the 5th of May yep. and it's the local elections in the UK, something I know you're very keenly following. Yeah, and in honour of that, uh, we thought we would do an episode which is kind of election related. This is the last episode of the major government. So it's the it's the last episode before Tony Blair swooped in and won the uh, 1997 general election. So this episode dates from the 30th of April 1997. We were thinking of doing the first episode of the uh, Tony Blair regime, but um, we watched that and it was really boring, wasn't it? So... It, it was rubbish. You, you, you really <laughs> tried to persuade me that there was something there, but... Uh... <laughs> it was it was it was rubbish so when yeah. you, you then saw this you're like oh hang on a minute <laughs> oh and change i mean change of plan because this is an extraordinary episode my, i think this is easily my top in my top three ever episodes you, you said which I, I i actually haven't sat down to think of what my favorite episodes are probably because we've only done 18 <laughs> it just mm. seems like a bit early for that but you you were quick out of the blocks to say top three instant with a bug oh yeah i loved it yeah. the only other episode i can think of is the um the one with Maggie Philbin doing archery, where oh, yeah. I, I watched it once and then immediately just watched it again straight after. I think that's a good testament to uh, how much I enjoyed it. I think the great thing about it is it, it's very 90s. It has a good variety of subjects, but also has such a, an amazing cast of characters in it. It has by far the most characters wow. in it of any of any episode we've ever seen, isn't it? Yeah, it, there's, absolutely. There's so many different people in it. And in fact, like most of my research is about the people this episode rather than the inventions themselves and if we so, had merch we'd be chucking out new t-shirts <laughs> like there's no tomorrow because they would be snapped up because <laughs> we are going to meet some i don't want to say people because that might be putting too strong word some odd bots yeah yeah i think action figures would be quite good oh, as well. some oh. of these characters <laughs> Although you've not seen my research, Mark, so we might no. have to, yeah. There's a few, there's a, there's <laughs> All you a... said in the text message was, prepare for revelations. It's like, wow, <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Revelations yeah. galore, Mark, revelations galore. <laughs> so the uh, Tony Blair election, Mark, uh, this is this is something which uh, obviously I remember. I remember the characters yeah. involved, but it's not something that I was, I would say, particularly enthralled by at the time as I was only 16. And um, But you were, weren't you? you were, I was, you were, yeah, you same were age. well into it. I was, I was well into it. Yeah, I mean, the same same way when we were talking about the episode or the day of uh, Thatcher's resignation and how, like, I was, you know, even then as a, like, a 10, 11-year-old, I was wrapped by policy. That hadn't shifted by the time this came around. I mean, all throughout the early 90s, and, and please don't think of me as some kind of nerd or something like that. It was just like a fantastic soap <laughs> or a sport. Oh, no, how dare you even think these things, let alone uh, say it out of my mouth. Uh, you know, for me, it was like soap opera and sport. That five-year term of John Major that's about to come to an end it was, it was incredible I mean and I, I just I kind of threw down some just some immediate thoughts you know that just came to me it's like there was the back to basics campaign that led to all those sex pest Tory MPs being forced to resign plus a couple who died there was the cash for questions which didn't take up just Neil Hamilton but also kind of also sucked in you know Jonathan Aiken there was the whole Maastricht treaty process and like Major's, you know, kind of bastards, that kind of European <laughs> renegade brigade led by kind of Ian Duncan Smith and stuff like that. Whatever happened to them? Whatever happened to <laughs> <laughs> that? You know, uh, and then there was like, there was, you know, obviously David Meller, you know, and there's other superstars of sleaze. And all throughout that period, you know, over that five years, watching John Major's majority get chipped away to absolutely nothing was so, so compelling. And then it all <laughs> came to a head with, you know, I, I you know, I was thinking about because uh, the anniversary of John Smith dying was, I suppose, probably about a year and a half ago, I'm guessing. And uh, often a lot of people say that um, he was the great Labour Prime Minister that wasn't. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a truth to that, but there's also a case of John Smith wouldn't have got the incredible 
result that Tony Blair did. And as a result of Tony Blair being there, the excitement, I think, was palpable. As I do, not because people were wrapped by politics, but there was just a sense of we were about to witness a cultural shift. 18, year, 18 years of conservative government from... from Mm-hmm. Thatcher all the way through to, you know, the the Cones hotline. Uh, you know, they had done everything, Ross. They had freed the Falklands it's, and they had... It's, all, sure we, they it's could... all we'd ever known, isn't it? It was all That's we'd ever thing. known. And that was the thing. It was all we'd ever known. And, and even, you know, you'd have to be in your 40s, I think, in the 90s, in, in, you know, by 97 came around to kind of really... For, for, for a Labour government to have had like a real impact in your adult life... Yeah, I mean, it was huge. And I, I was even saying to you in the notes, it's like, it, it was kind of like, it felt like a, it was it was as much like a World Cup. It was something the nation was going to kind of rally around. And I remember like there were ads for the Mexican food stuff with the yellow boxes. Old El Paso. Old El Paso. I remember Old El Paso having <laughs> election themed ads. Really? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I, I meant to look it up on YouTube, but like it's in my head because it's turning, you know, and like there were, there were other like election themed that the way with the World Cup that you have like, you know, there's a lot of companies out there who do not sponsor the World Cup. You know, they're not Coke, they're not McDonald's or whatever or, or Gazprom and nor do they sponsor the English football team or whoever, but they always try and kind of, you know, Oh, you know, Curry's are doing a deal on TVs because the big match is coming. You know, for the for the big <laughs> summer matches, you're gonna. And it was that kind. There was all these ads that were kind of election rate because it was a kind of a cultural event. Uh, you know, yeah. I might be going overboard, but like so that's how I felt. I think most people did, and and I avidly consumed it. Like I could not fit enough into my eyeball. I would at that point our school timetables were pretty light, so I'd be going home. I'd be watching live the live press conferences. I I swear, and I don't know if you remember, but there was the press conference when during the election campaign. Campaign. People in the Tory party were sniping about John Major's campaign and kind of briefing journalists. And, and obviously, you know, I just remember him like pleading down the barrel of the camera and putting his fist together, saying, <laughs> don't bind my hands. And it's like, you know, obviously the election is over. <laughs> but like all these incredible moments I remember watching, you know, and then I would avidly watch Newsnight and I was just spooning it all up, Russ, sucking it all, <laughs> drinking the milkshake, you know. Absolutely fantastic entertainment for me. You know, I, did, I couldn't vote. You couldn't vote. I mean, I'm sure I would have voted New Labour, but then most people would have voted New Labour. In fact, most people did vote New Labour's whole point. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then they, the evening itself. I mean, this is this is election eve. I'm sure I was probably straight buzzing with excitement about you know thinking about I'll pres- the. I'll just say I presume I presume Peter Snow was involved. Uh, yeah, yeah, put, yeah. yeah. A pre tomorrow's world, Peter Snow. A pre tomorrow's world, Peter Snow. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. he definitely did the 2001 election as well, didn't he? Like he, yeah. Because tomorrow's world was definitely a bit of a side hustle for him. Hmm. But yeah, I, you know, I, I watched it all. I was definitely awake for Enfield Southgate. You know, the Portillo moment. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, the whole thing was wonderful. I remember. I watched live as Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, leader of the referendum party, whatever happened to them and whatever they were trying to do. You know, he was mocking David Meller from the dais as David Meller lost. And I just like, oh, I just couldn't get enough of it. And it, the fun didn't stop because then you had a whole load of defenestrations in the Tory party. You know, they, they fell apart, which is just entertaining when any party does that, really. You know, when they all turn on themselves. Like the, yeah. They're all nests of vipers. Yeah, great days. Can't go back, Russ. <laughs> and I, I think I was even awake when Tony Blair was at the Royal Festival Hall and he goes, uh, you know, a new day has dawned, has it not? You um, don't remember any, n- none of the, you just, you just weren't, you no, just weren't I, riding I, the same I, train. I, I honestly, I, I honestly couldn't tell you what I would, what I do remember from it because obviously what's happened now is there's so much. There's a collective memory. Yeah. There's a collective memory yeah, and yeah. I could not tell you which parts of it I actually witnessed myself or which parts are just things that I've absorbed from the, you know. Yeah. yeah. So no, I don't know. But I was just thinking it's how, like. Obviously, you've got you just mentioned Portillo being humiliated there. Mm. He's probably one of the most liked people <laughs> to come out of that election yeah. now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah with his yeah. train programs and his colourful trousers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other weird one, I think, is John Major himself. Like what I what I noticed is whenever something terrible goes goes on, say Brexit or uh, or the Tory Party doing something absolutely heinous, if they wheel out Tony Blair. People will go, and he and he criticizes it. People go, "Oh, shut up, Blair! We don't you war criminal. Go away! Yeah, you don't know yeah. what you're talking about like that." But if they wheel out John Major and he yeah. says the same thing, they go, "Oh, John Major, he was a proper conservative, yeah, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> a grand older statesman knows what he's talking about and all that." It's very strange that the but, loser of that election is now more respected, well regarded, than the, and respected. Yeah, the, yeah. I, in a weird way, I think a similar thing has happened to Gordon Brown. Where like Gordon Brown was a pretty awful prime minister for a lot of reasons, and yet when he gets wheeled out like he, he, Gordon Brown always talked about a moral compass and I think 
Gordon Brown, for all his faults, had a moral compass. And it was very important to him. He, he felt like he knew what, what was right and what was wrong. So when he comes out to talk about things, he's talking about things he believes are wrong. And he's telling you how he's going to fix them. John Major was exactly the same. He had a moral compass. You know, he, ha he had no charisma and he had a very bad <laughs> PR operation, but he had a moral compass. So when he does interject... He's telling you stuff that, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And you go, yeah, you're right. Whereas like Tony Blair, I'm sure has a moral compass, but I mean, you know, it's, uh, it needs a bit of dusting down every now and then. <laughs> it definitely lost his way at times. You know, there's a reason he's remembered as he is. I think unfairly, he's remembered badly. I, know, I don't want to get too political because, like, you know, it, this isn't about how, how you vote or anything like that. To me, this, is, this was about the sheer human entertainment and the joy of especially a British election, I think, is that because there is a head of state, because the Queen is the head of state, and the Prime Minister is only the head of government, there is a removal van taking them away <laughs> within hours of them being kicked out. It is so heartless and cruel. It's like straight down Bucky Pally with you, off you. And then the other guy, yesterday's news, I, you know, I don't know if you remember, but I'm really sure that the following day, the following day, like less than 12 hours probably after the exit poll came through, John Major was at the Oval or at the Lords watching cricket. Oh, yes, no, like, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. He, basically, he's like, well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Not interested. You, ha you know, you're on your own that, now, and that was brilliant. And that he was must right. Be, yeah. That must be such a such Pre a relief, mustn't it? Oh, though, as well, can't imagine. Imagine how you how relieved he felt just sitting there watching the cricket, just thinking, oh. All that behind me. Because <laughs> one of the very first things that happens to any new prime minister who comes in, I, I mean, you know, al almost, you know, within the hour, they are asked to sign letters that will go to the nuclear submarines the next time they're in port to explain what the prime minister expects of them should Britain be destroyed and they haven't received any orders. Mm. That's your first act. That's like <laughs> one of your first acts. <laughs> so John Major was probably sitting there and watching the cricket and they're like... Not my responsibility <laughs> anymore. It's like, because Theresa May did the same thing. I, I, the yeah. day after she resigned as Prime Minister, she was straight down the Oval to watch the, the cricket. More power to your elbow, that's what I say. I bet you Absolutely. they are delighted, because you know she's having the time of her life right now. Anyway, we're not talking about politics, we're talking about entertainment. Yeah, so, so no, there you yes. go. I was, uh, even now, just remembering it, it was just an excitement. But I, I promise you, I have similar memories about literally every election I've ever watched. They're all incredibly <laughs> yeah. exciting to me, even if some have hurt more than others. Let's hope tonight's elections provide you with some excitement, Mark. It'll probably be more tomorrow morning. Because yeah. they're not a general election, they, they tend to slow things right down. Well, we won't be announcing any uh, any results <laughs> li live oh, on I the don't show know. then. Some of these recordings do go on. <laughs> Well, talking of going on, should we just hit cracking? Let's Absolutely. go for it. Yeah, no, definitely. Let's go for it. on tonight's Tomorrow's World, what every man has dreaded, but every woman has dreamed of. It's the contraceptive pill for men. From a Chinese remedy, this doctor has discovered just what it takes to make the elusive male pill a reality. Also, man versus machine. Is this the chess computer to finally beat world champion Garry Kasparov? The world champion thinks not. The losing is not an option. And how athletes in America are sleeping their way to the top. Oh, quick theme tune update, Mark. Yep. You remember last time we had this theme tune, this slightly boring theme tune? Yes. I said that there was somebody on the internet who was trying to find out yes. what it was yes. desperately. I've checked in on them. They've still not found out who it's <laughs> by or what it is. So well, no update there. No update there. Uh, well, no. please keep keep abreast of, of, oh, the, oh, of, of oh, this oh, non-breaking story. Yeah. Have, you, have you reached out to him? No, I haven't actually. Oh. No. After Next this, episode. I will. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, definitely. That'd be I great. Could probably, yeah, I might prod them, you know, might get them uh, doing my work for me. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Good idea. Anyway, a title sequence, Mark. Uh, any observations? Zero, Russ, because thank God we've already had it. Yeah, episode four from 1996. Kel Surprise, an episode broadcast six months before this, has exactly the same theme tune, exactly <laughs> the same opening credits. That was the one you remember where um, Philip Forrester was trying to drug dogs. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely nothing to say. We can absolutely move on to the introduction. 
Uh, and the fact that the set hasn't changed. Actually, I just, that was the other thing. Like the set hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. This is exactly the same. So go back. This is episode four. And then we'll stop talking about that. Come back and join us here. But as a, as a late as a late episode, it's one of those ones that has a little introduction that tells us what's coming it's... up in the program. And I think there's something, I would say the one thing that struck me about this here is uh, one of the items is about a male contraceptive pill. And Howard introduces it by saying, what every man has dreaded, but every woman has dreamed of, right? I didn't understand that, Mark. Why would every man dread having a contraceptive pill? It's not as well, if every man wants to go around making women pregnant all the time, is it? Surely surely the opposite is true. Surely men want to go around sleeping with women all over the place and not making them pregnant. So surely it's what men would really like, having a contraceptive pill. You you were filling in your notes last night. and I, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was reading them as you were filling them in. Uh, and for the benefit of the listeners at home, Russell went on a real journey with this question. <laughs> And uh, you alighted on what I think is the answer, which is the second part of the second paragraph, because the first one is like, well, this makes no sense. You know, men aren't, you know, the idea of men, they'd be delighted to go around and have loads of sex without the, you know, thinking any babes are coming. And then you say, oh, hang on, I think I've got it. It's like, actually, I, th- I think I think Howard's point here, I think Howard's point is like, men have dreaded the idea that they have to take responsibility for anything. <laughs> and, you know, they're going to be in charge. It was like, oh, because like now they're thinking like, oh, did I take the pill? I better take 15 just in case. <laughs> I'm going to stag do. I better take 15 because I'm definitely going to score. <laughs> Immediately rush to hospital with a heart attack. <laughs> I don't think it's anything yeah. to do with the idea. You know, men aren't. You know, absolutely. I, also, like, it's just it's it. It was such a it's such a weird line because <laughs> I I don't know. I, I think it's I funny if I I I thought I thought of it the other way, which is like something that women w- would have dreaded. I mean, ultimately, I think were there to be pills for everyone, either everyone would take them or no one would take them. Like, you, you know, you wouldn't trust anyone. <laughs> no one. No, would trust no. It. Yeah, that comes up a bit later, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. So yeah. I think it, I think it's responsibility dodging at the moment. It's entirely on the women. You don't have to do anything. There is something else I spotted in that intro, Mark. It's a slightly delicate matter, and it also relates to Howard again, and that's. On his Twitter feed, Howard has suggested that the baby in this sequence, oh, yeah. well, the, the baby is we call the uh, the Nirvana baby. Howard suggested that it was a girl. He said that he said that he he's met, met her. Meta. Yeah, yeah. Whereas there's an extended bit of the of the intro here. No pun intended. Just after, <laughs> yeah, this baby has a lot more in common with the Nirvana baby than we previously realised. Yep. In that it is yeah. very definitely a little boy. Very definitely um, a little boy. Yeah. Yeah. So what? <laughs> I wonder who, who that Howard was meet? that Howard met. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would also say the last the last time, so episode four, when we discussed the similar epoch of Tomorrow's World, Howard and Shanaz were also presenting. Their clothes were a riot of lime and yellow. And I, <laughs> Howard was wearing what I think I described as like reverse Rupert the Bear trousers. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it, is, it is, I think, a great relief that they've clearly matured and sobered up because they're both wearing very sensible, very fashionable for the day suits. Very, I think look very normal. I think I, I know why that is, though, Mark. <gasps> you because do? You have a theory? I do, yeah. Yeah, no, I have a theory. It's because they know that we've added the most notable clothing <gasps> do. Part yes, to our yeah. audit. Yeah, absolutely right. And they've also already seen the segments of this program and know that there are a number of God, people right. who absolutely yeah. smash it out of the park and there's yeah. no way that they'd be able to compete with it. So They're they may as well. Just... You're absolutely exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. love it. I love it. But yeah, so that's, I guess that's the intro, isn't it? There's not much else we can say about it, is there? The, the only thing I want to say was that they, they go big on the male contraceptive segment. And I think they kind of imply that it's the main part of the program. And I, I, I don't think it is. I, it's not the best segment. And I think it's no more or less long or interesting than other segments. But then married with one of the segments is about the benefits or how you can artificially induce the benefits of high altitude training for athletes. And Shana's Oh, she makes a statement how athletes in America are sleeping their way to the top. And I just, the the whole thing had a kind of a, was I wrong in thinking like, have they, has someone in the office been reading too many copies of Loaded magazine? <laughs> like, is, is, is this Tomorrow's World trying to lad it up? I, I guess with that, it's quite irresistible though, because they really are sort of sleeping their way to the top though, aren't they? Like. It, Don't get me it, it wrong, is a good, it's very clever wordplay. It is a good play. pun. It's a very <laughs> yeah. clever bit of wordplay. It also does lead you astray. Yes, it does. Yeah, absolute filth. That's a filth merchants. All that in a moment. But first, have you ever wished you could be in two places at once? Well, now you can. As long as you have a robot head. Hello? Hello, Mummy. 
Oh, Alia, darling, hi. Listen, I'm going to put you on the speakerphone. Hang on one sec. Yeah, hang on. Here we go. Remember my TED is at four o'clock. Four o'clock sharp, I'll be there. Bye. Yeah, good luck. I'll see you later. Bye. More than my life's worth to miss that. She's been practising all week. Right. And that. Now who? Hello? Hi, Shana's. Just calling to remind everybody about that big editorial meeting at four o'clock. But maybe all is not lost, because now there's a way you can be in two places at once. It's called telepresence, and it involves a robot that you place at the end of a phone line. Gordon Mayer's one of the pioneers in the field. Using a headset with little televisions inside, he can see through his robot's eyes wherever it may be. In this case, just in front of him. For this demonstration, we're feeding the picture from his visor to a TV behind us so we can see exactly what he's seeing. By using this type of system, the robot head can copy my movements. And it means that I can actually be wherever the robot head is. As I raise my head up, it moves up. As I move my head down, it moves down. Contender for the worst robot we've seen, Mark? <laughs> Cripes. Yeah. It might be the worst. I hadn't even thought about that. It might be the worst we've seen. Yeah. To describe it for those who won't watch this on YouTube, what would you say it is? It's it's like it's a, a meter tall. It's it's two hollow cubes. It's so it's so heavy looking. It's so bloody heavy. So it's it's kind of one cube shaped thing uh, which has all the guts and some of the machinery. Yeah, not the, bike, and then the base. Yeah, and then there's like three sticks, which obviously help movement. Uh, and then there's a similar sized cube above it. And sticking it from the front, the quote unquote, the front are two cameras so that you can put on your VR helmet and have some kind of 3D vision. And as you move your head with the VR goggles, the head of the robot moves. And it's so noisy. It's bloody huge. And there's a great scene where Gordon Mayer says, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll go and I'll, we can use this, I'll, you know, and then he carries this thing. And it's, <laughs> it is, so, it, he is trying to pretend it is not heavy at all. It's really rotten. This is this is really <laughs> rotten. Before we get to the invention itself, because obviously it's teleconferencing, right? It, it, it's actually what you and I are doing now, basically, which is that, you know, we're on a yes. Zoom call. And, um, but, and But with a slightly more, it's meant to have a slightly more immersive aspect isn't it that's definitely... yeah uh, that's the difference right that that yeah. third dimension and the fact that it moves around so uh, it by the way this is not a cute looking thing at all there's, there's no face in this uh, this is very very alpha well, it's not even beta yeah uh, anyway it's got, it's got a lovely it's got a lovely mane of wire hair it, I, it I, does I, I, I... <laughs> which because we're watching in sd at times looks a bit tartan-esque i thought uh <laughs> which i thought was very appropriate let's let's start at the beginning because because shanaz asks a question have you have you ever wished you could be in two places at once so the question then is is this the solution right so the idea is that she has two competing events at four o'clock on the day one we heard her daughter her lovely adorable cute daughter um, who i know all about now mark <laughs> do you really Aaliyah <laughs> yeah pakravan fabulous uh, Aaliyah lily pakravan yeah Aaliyah yeah. lily pakravan okay wonderful we'll, we'll get there in a minute great little bit right she you know shanaz is in the office Busy tapping away, single digit tapping, you know, she's yeah. churning out this, the probably, oh, it's probably some kind of mad postmodern meta narrative where she's churning out the very script she's reading from, I'm guessing. <laughs> and then her daughter rings and she's absolutely adorable, can't act for toffee, which is exactly correct, but it looks like she's having the time of her life. Shanaz, I think, signs off the phone call to her, I'm assuming, adored and beloved daughter with a wonderful bit of genuine business talk, which is like, yeah, good luck. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is wonderful. The warmth between mother and daughter, I thought, was uh, outrageous. Shanaz then gets another phone call. It's a work meeting. So this tennis event that her daughter is reminding about clashes with this really important editorial meeting, Russ. She needs to be mm. in two places at once. And of course, this is not this this this. <laughs> and on no reading of anything is this a solution to that problem? Because no. as I said to you in my notes, she's not in two places at once. In fact, she's no. half arsing both. <laughs> she's neither being there for her daughter nor is she being there for her 
meeting because at, at the end we'll see that she is in the meeting wearing VR goggles whilst this wonderful <laughs> robot is on top of a umpire's chair slowly <laughs> moving its head left to right in a kind of comedic you know Wimbledon style and you know she is not present in the meeting and she's not present for her daughter shocking shocking I, I just, and it just really where it was like you can't be in two places at once you'd have to split yourself in two she, she's not working and she's not being a mum I don't know what this is <laughs> Because you know, all of her attention is on the tennis match, so so the fact that she's but she's not there, and <laughs> yeah, is, is irrelevant. <laughs> in fact, in fact, yeah. is incredibly disrespectful. I would imagine they would have much rather <laughs> she had gone to the tennis event. She's no more in two places at once than when you rang your mum on a landline, and the fact that you are stood in your halls at university and your voice is coming out in your mum's house means that you are in two places at once. You're not. She then produces a list of kind of serious applications that this possibly could be used for. And they are quite serious. Well, some of them are quite serious. By the way, this comes like 95% of this segment is done. And then they, they finally trip over and reveal that there may be some reason that this might possibly exist. So it's like it was inside nuclear reactors, in space, for bomb disposal, deep sea diving, or even virtual tourism. So that was the solution. The idea is like this thing would be in Chernobyl. You'd be able to look around and go like, and do what exactly? It's got no arms. I don't know what you... Basically, this is just a way of... <laughs> it's a lucky loo, you know? I don't know. I don't... I don't... Ugh. I was very disappointed that she didn't mention uh, on an oil rig there. That, that would have been an easy one for an easy <laughs> one for us, isn't it? Because like, that's no, normally it's normally in space in a nuclear reactor on an oil rig. There you are. These are different times now, Russ. These, these are different well, times, my friend. These are the nineties. Yeah. There's a, a few little things that I noticed in this, which I thought was interesting. Like uh, number one, Alia Pakravan, despite being I believe six here, is using a mobile phone in mm. 1997. Mm. I can't imagine there's many six-year-olds operating mobile phones no. in 1997. So I don't know whether that... Would you, was that, do you think it was meant to suggest that this is what's going to happen in the near future, where right? everyone's going to have a mobile phone and everyone's going to have a tele, telepresence machine? Uh, is that, I is think that the idea? Ex- or is no, it just because they could, had no other way of getting her to phone from a yeah. tennis club? It's probably just easy to have her sit at a table outside the tennis club rather than like, set up an entire camera crew <laughs> At, you know, by the payphone. <laughs> but also, the other thing is in that in that in that particular scene there, there is a huge can of Coke sitting <laughs> right huge. in right yeah. in shots, right, almost obscuring the screen. I don't know whether that, why that was necessary. I, I should say, there. for the benefit of listeners at home, it's not a giant can of Coke. It's just really close to the camera, just in case you. Were oh excited. yeah, no, yeah. I, I should have uh, remembered that from last episode, shouldn't I? Yes, things yes, close yes. to the camera are larger, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Perspective, yeah, I remember. No. I knew Raymond was telling me that for some reason. <laughs> would you like to know, Mark, about uh, Alia Lily Pakravan? I would, yeah. So the great thing about the internet these days is that uh, you can piece together people's people's lives by the sort of the is that, tri- is that a great <laughs> thing, the, the trail, <laughs> the trail they leave. I, I, already, I feel skeevy. But so what, what I managed to piece together from various social media things and things like that is that she about 10, 10, 10 years ago she worked as a fashion writer. Uh, and stylist in Dubai. And if you look at the bottom of our notes, Mark, oh, okay, I've posted a photo of her. <laughs> okay, wow, well, there you go. Okay, yeah, very glamorous. So very glamorous. Yes, Crikey. very glamorous indeed. She um, looks a lot older in these photos than she does on this episode of Tomorrow's World. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so then she's working there until she, so she's working with Grazia in Dubai. Yep. And then 2014 comes along, and I don't know what happened there, but she decides to go travelling for four years. And this is where it goes. It gets interesting because Mm -hmm. uh, she's followed the old tried and tested path where she goes travelling and comes back a completely changed person. So she's, I think she went to India. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I think she went to India. So she probably smoked, um, you know, a few doobies in Goa, dropped some acid, things like that. Comes back, reappears in the world in 2018, and suddenly she, looking a lot more like a hippie, tribal tattoo on her arm, immediately becomes a yoga uh, instructor. Oh. But But then decides to release a music album. So she started an Indiegogo in 2018, <laughs> and she, uh, she wants to release a music album. She wants to raise uh, $5,000, pay for the recording and the equipment, things like that. Do you know how much she made? Not enough. Uh, <laughs> 180 quid. Two hundred and forty dollars, Mark. Oh, but I would say one hundred eighty pounds. I, I would say that the problem the problem is is that I would have thought that somebody who worked in the fashion industry or, or, yeah. or you know around the fashion industry would understand the um, benefits of PR and, yeah, and yeah, marketing yeah, yeah. and things yeah. like that. Did a very very minimal effort uh, of uh, marketing this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing that exists is a little a little YouTube video 
which I might drop a little segment of in, Ooh. Uh, where she where she introduces what her album's going to be. Music means so many different things to so many different people. In music, there is acceptance and surrender, and we can be moved to tears, to movement, to joy, to connection, to understanding, and to resolution. These are the healers of our world. But you don't even see her in the video. You just see yeah. like some fluttering flags, and she talks a load of old hippie nonsense. But I could give you the I could give you the 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 track listing of the album. Oh yeah, uh, as it was going to be. It's eleven tracks. Track one, Great Spirit Wings. Track two, Lands. Track three, Nourished. Track four, Wish Upon You. Track five, Truth of a Child. Track six, Birthed You. Track seven, Wings. Track eight, Lightly Gliding. Track nine, Meeting Edges. Track 10, Your Wings Are Waiting. What and track wings? 11, Call of Nature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, but apparently music has played a huge role in her life and that shifted into a higher meaning when she was opened up to the power of vibration, sounds and words about four years ago. She right. received music as a teacher and a healer and she helped to reshape her, her life of seeing herself and understanding about the world. Okay. So like I said, yeah, it sounds like she probably went to Goa and did a load of drugs. Well. So just to be sure, she didn't play tennis professionally, right? And can I just, just get that on the record? <laughs> yeah, no, weirdly, those tennis lessons did not... Oh, she's not practicing all week. <laughs> let, let no one be in any doubt whatsoever that if you've been on Tomorrow's World, Russell will track you down. Be also aware that like all the information that Russell just that was all public. <laughs> it's all out there for you to read, isn't it? <laughs> you know, maybe with this extra publicity that we're giving her album, oh, she might be able. Yeah, you're right. They might, they might, it's the it's the it's the publicity push she needs, and she'll be able yeah. to to bring out because I couldn't really find out what she's currently doing these days. But I guess maybe Lear- learning her lesson about oversharing i think <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i guess so but uh the second photo mark if you cast your eyes three inches south of the photo of her yeah i guess who that is is that gordon that is gordon that is that's gordon, gordon mayor yeah that's gordon mayor's graduation photo fabulous because we, we haven't mentioned him yet he, he's the scottish academic who has invented this he has invented what he persists in calling telepresence Mm. This, uh, you know, which is this new word that I think he thinks is going to be Hoover or Tannoy or Jacuzzi. <laughs> it's going to just be synonymous with whatever he thinks this is. Telepresence, telepresence head. And he's a lovely, lovely man. He, as I said to you, he's, a, he, he's, he's the next in a long line of like really nice, lovely people who come on to Tomorrow's World to show off what they've come up with and are just adorable and really excited. And he's very nice. Initially, I thought he looked like the third chuckle brother who had taken up accounting. But the, this this third time or fourth time of seeing it, he actually looks like 1970s Graham Sooners. <laughs> he does, but it, but to me, when he had the when he had the headset on, mm. he looked very much like the the fella in Tremors who's got the yeah, basement yeah, full yeah, of guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ba- basically, pick pick somebody pick, with a big yeah. droopy moustache, and, yeah. <laughs> and so that's what he looks you're like. You're showing me. I, I say it's, it's not even se- sepia tinted so much as it's it's photo tinted <laughs> sepia of right. Gordon graduating in in I don't know when the 70s, I assume. Yes, well, it looks like he might have graduated on Mars, doesn't it? Like, I mean, it's, <laughs> it really it's, does, it, yeah. It really yeah. is quite a red photo. Yeah. Gordon didn't actually invent the word tele- telepresence. Did he not? That was no. That was previously invented. There's something very interesting about Gordon, which is related to this, which I which I think is worth mentioning. Gordon is not a robotics engineer by training. He was just trained as a normal engineer, and he worked uh, for an industrial pump manufacturer, right? Yeah. And then in 1980, the University of Strathclyde they advertised for an industrial robotics expert, right? But he just went. He went for the job. And to, to quote him, he said, As I was interested in automation and an avid reader of science fiction, I convinced the interview panel that I was the right person for the job. <laughs> so, so basically, I think he just, he just like watched, <laughs> he'd watched Star Wars and uh, Battlestar Galactica and things yeah. like that and somehow blagged his way past the interview team to become robotics experts. No, no imposter University. syndrome for Gordon, currently. No, no, no. The reason this head originally came about was that... And I'd, I'd never heard of this. You're an, you're a bit of an Olympics buff, so maybe you've mm. heard of this, Mark. But there was the first robotic Olympics was held in Glasgow in 1990. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? I did. I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I obviously quickly looked that up. Quite interesting to see the medal table. Oh. England won mm. uh, with 22 points. Scotland came second with 16. 
And then you've got the USA, Japan, and USSR coming coming up the coming up the rear. I don't know whether that you know that suggests that. Do you think the robots were so heavy back then that, <laughs> that there's a bit of a local advantage? There's only so many you can get on, on a plane <laughs> in the overhead locker. Yeah, 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 that, that, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's true. But like any Olympics, there was various different uh, disciplines. What's the word? Ev- ev- yeah, yeah, disciplines and events, uh, and you know things like climbing a wall, avoiding obstacles, talking, all these sorts of different things. This thing that jumped out at me was the robots that got disqualified. Oh, exciting. There were three robots disqualified, right? This is what they're disqualified for, okay? So Japan's Yamabiko robot got disqualified from the talking event because it could not speak English. That's a bit unfair, isn't that's it? That's really I mean, it unfair. Speaking perfect yeah, Japanese. That's absolutely, that's ridiculous. <laughs> disqualified. Okay. Uh, Sayas, the Indian robot, also got disqualified from the talking event <laughs> because it was completely incomprehensible. Like, okay. Is that... <laughs> well, why disqualify it? Why not just mark it down? I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is the, my personal favourite. Robug 2, which is the English wall climbing robot, uh, that got disqualified, not only for veering out of lane, <laughs> okay. but also demonstrating inappropriate behaviour in front of children. <laughs> what? What did it, what did it do? <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say? It's not, it's not elaborated. That's just the reason. What There's the hell no elaboration. <laughs> what could a wall climbing robot possibly do? That in was, 1990. In, in 1990. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was deemed inappropriate, inappropriate for, for children. children. That is so weird. What? And it's not elaborated upon. No, no, no. no it's just a, just a table. Um, it's just a table. But yeah, anyway, yeah. So so anyway, this whatever this robot was that hit that, yeah. that, that Gordon knocked up for this Olympics, I think it was to do with the talking event, I think maybe, because he was meant to make a anthropomorphic head. Yes. Which it was what he was aiming for. And this thing is, I mean, it stretches anthropomorphic quite a lot, doesn't it? I mean, to me, anthropomorphic... Oh. Sorry, th- this is supposed to be anthropomorphic. <laughs> so this, no, I, this is this is an serious? offshoot of it. So, oh, so it's so, no, it's yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of work being done here. If you think it's anthropomorphic, yeah, no. The original plan was to make it anthropomorphic, and then he became obsessed with the idea of telepresence. Yes. So that's how that's he steered it in that direction instead. Which, but you know, I still feel good foresight of him. Like I mean, you know, I'd say up until. 2020, you know, telepresence, for want of a better word, was always seen as being the future of work. So, like, you know, yeah. the, fact, the fact that in 1990, whatever, he was thinking, like, oh, I, I, hang on a minute, this, this, this could be really important. Like, it took a global pandemic for us all to realise that we actually can do quite well without leaving our homes. That, yeah. I mean, that's that's very clever of him. I mean, that's you know, good foresight. But you fear he, I, I'm get, I, without having done any research, you fear he probably got trapped in this rut of like just trying to perfect this robot rather than well, anything else. Exactly. Well, this yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's, it, what it reminded me of. You remember, you remember the, a couple of episodes ago, there was that fellow with the with the submarine. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, it's, don't, it's, that's it's, a heartbreaking story, isn't it's, it? It's not. It's not quite as heartbreaking, but it's so he invented the term transparent telepresence which he defined as the experience of being present interactively at a live real world location remote from one's immediate own physical location. Okay. I don't know why that's any different than normal telepresence. I don't know. What, no. Anyway. But anyway, he formed the te- Transparent Telepresence Research Group and got funding of over £2 million. Wow. And then spun off a company. When the mobile phones came about, he spun off a company because he thought, oh, mobile phones would be make this even better. Yeah. But then fell 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 venture capitalists who get the impression he didn't like because they kept trying to take too much of his company from him. Yeah. So he said, although I enjoyed the experience, I decided to dissolve the company in 2006 for a variety of reasons. Mm. I would say main reason being that that robot's crazy. It's awful. <laughs> awful. Oh, it and, looks rotten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I presume that's probably why the venture capitalists wanted so much of the business because you're not going to risk anything on that, are you? No, it's... no, you're not. No, unfortunately not. He retired in 2015. He's still about, but he retired in 2015. And he was asked what he's most proud of, and he said, "Proud is perhaps not the correct word, but I've been really pleased to have created the Transparent Telepresence Research Group." I don't understand what he means. Is he? Do you think it's it's wrong to be proud of something? I'm not sure, or whether, or does he just realise it's not very good? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. It, it, actually, do you know what? That's a good question. My initial instinct was that he it didn't go anywhere. So how can you be proud of it? But, you know, <laughs> he did a good job. But actually, you could be right. Maybe just, you know, pride is is one of the seven deadly sins. So, yeah, let's let's give him that one. He seems, yeah. like, a lovely, he seems yeah. like a lovely guy. Yeah. And Happy I, retirement, I mean, Gordon. So the term telepresence <laughs> itself was actually, it was coined by a, an American 
Britain's cognitive scientist called Marvin Minsky. It's a good name. That's a great name. In 1980, who'd, who'd read a few different sci-fi novels. So once again, another, another person who's just influenced by sci-fi. Swinging it. <laughs> uh, and it, there was in a few of these novels, they they sort of come up with the the idea of telepresence in the future, and uh, he he's the one that gave it the name. But but the first company, so the a company that predates Gordon's efforts, is an American company called Teleport. And it was two blokes who owned, they owned a holiday resort business. And what they realized was that the, the people staying in their holiday resorts, if they didn't have to leave and go to business meetings, they'd spend longer in their holiday resorts. So they, they invented the first telepresence hmm. machines because they wanted people to just stay in their holiday resorts for longer. They managed to like sell it to Hilton and, uh, and get them set up in Hilton hotels for a bit. Hmm. No one used them because it's, it's an absolutely bad idea. Well, yeah, so I'm actually in, in was 19, this? This, was, this was in 1993. Oh, wow. Okay. So in 1993, I imagine the technology was, uh, you know... I can't imagine it felt like you were really at a meeting. I imagine it was probably quite... And, and any new technology, you're not going to get people to, to take it up, really. But they did have a lot of useful patents. Mm. So unlike poor Gordon, who uh, you know wound up the business and didn't really get anything from it, they sold their business to HP in 2007 for $60 million. Hey, <laughs> well done. Yeah. Gosh, that's real yeah. money. I wonder, I, I wonder if Gordon kept up with that and, you know, I don't know, you know he read the news well, there. It's around the same time, isn't it? Sh- shaking he, his yeah. fist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it is still a thing that they're trying to do, they're trying to develop now. But the main thing they want to do it for, well, there's two main things. One is space, obviously, because mm. if you've got robot astronauts, you can operate from the ground. Mm. That's, I mean, that's brilliant. You're taking away a lot of the hazards and things like that. And they've got one called Robonaut Two, which they've sent been up to the I, the ISS and they've moved about and things mm. like that. It's currently on the ground being repaired and upgraded, but they're going to send it up again and try and see if they can send it out on like external oh, okay cool. space space yeah. walks and things yeah. like that. But the big the big one that all all of the money money's going into is surgery because obviously with surgeons you've got specialists. Mm. So if you've got like a rare thing that there's only you know got the world's best surgeon in one particular thing, he can't be all over the world, and you know it's not practical for him to be all over the world. But if you had all of these you know surgery robots all over the world, he could operate them from his luxury house in Malibu or wherever, yeah, and apply his expertise and do the surgery without having to leave the comfort of his own home. This is this is the thing that you know they're really going for, and will probably be the main thing that you know pushes progress with it. Mm. There's no point in doing it for meetings and things. Like like that is there no it, no it's it's there isn't no and of course uh in the world of fiction you've got iron man he quite often does it because he's quite often not in his suit isn't he that's true that's basically that's basically telepresence yeah and also everyone's favorite film avatar and it's uh it's four <laughs> sequels you know that's telepresencing into a big blue alien yeah yeah i suppose it is yeah maybe yeah. that's why gordon packed it in then and he didn't know he couldn't find himself enough unobtainium <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to find, Russ. Game, set and match, Ms. Pakravan. And from tennis to athletics, with big money at stake, athletes will try anything to stay one step ahead of the pack. And some methods are more legal than others. Well, in Colorado, we've come across a brand new piece of technology designed to boost an athlete's performance. And we'll leave it to you to judge if it's cheating or not. An energetic Philippa Forrester reports from the Rocky Mountains. It's all about that extra one hundredth of a second, jumping that extra centimetre or lifting just one more kilogram. In the world of athletics, everyone wants to improve. There are lots of ways to increase your performance. One is to train long and hard, fine-tuning your body ready for that big event. But there's a physical limit to how hard and how long you can train, so athletes look for other advantages. One method is to increase the amount of red blood cells that carry oxygen around the body. If they can get more oxygen to the muscles, athletes should be able to compete harder. This idea was adopted by the USA cycling team in the 1984 Olympics. They won a record nine medals. However, later it was revealed that many of them had removed and stored a pint of their own blood sometime before the event. Their bodies made up for this loss quickly. And then, before the race, the stored blood was put back into their bodies. That gave a dramatic increase in the vital oxygen carrying red blood cells. This technique is now illegal. Another illegal method is by the use of drugs. This is a synthetic version of a hormone found in the body that stimulates red blood cell production. 
Previously, it's been incredibly hard to detect, but they will be able to detect it at the next Olympics in Sydney. There is a natural way to increase your red blood cell count, training at high altitudes. The air's thinner here, so to make most of the limited oxygen available, the body has to adjust by making more red blood cells. But there is a downside. The disadvantage at high altitude is fatigue and your quality of training is quite low. So I wanted to invent some sort of way that you could have the best of both possible worlds. You could live at high altitude, have all the advantages of high altitude, but yet you can also train at sea level. In his quest, Eagle worked long and hard to find something that could simulate a high altitude environment. And this is what he came up with. It may look like some kind of strange submarine, but actually, it's a bed. What you do is sleep in here overnight, and the bed mimics sleeping at 15,000 feet. Now, before we get into this, Mark, and we really are <laughs> going to get into this one, it occurred to me while watching that, because uh, Philip is in Colorado there, is that we know that both Howard, Howard either lived or lives in Colorado, and Philippa, until fairly recently, lived in Wyoming. And they're only just down the road from each other. And I just wondered, do you reckon they ever, uh, ever paid each other a visit at any point, oh, say hello? I'd like to think so. I would like yeah. to think so. I don't know, but I'd like to think so. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Lovely idea. They meet up for, you know, brunch at a Denny's. I've never <laughs> been to a Denny's, but that's that's a oh, place people awful. go. Oh, are they really yeah. bad? Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Better off going to the IHOP. Oh, that makes sense. And they're always near a freeway, aren't they? Yeah, and I hope. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah, so we have, as I say, we're in Colorado. Uh, uh, an energetic Philippa Forrester, as Howard calls her, is in Colorado, running up a mountain, explaining to us the benefits of high altitude training, and then introducing us to a, um, well, first one character, <laughs> a man called a man called Igor Gamov, and uh, he's invented a uh, special little hyperbaric. I guess it's hyperbaric, isn't it? Hyperbaric. I thought hyperbaric, hyperbaric was the word I thought. Yeah. Hyperbaric chamber. Yeah. You can sleep in to give the effect of being at high altitude when when you're not. And then uh, that character then meets another character <laughs> yep. in the in the form of um, Arnie Baker, the cycling trainer. Doctor Arnie Baker, bears an, yeah, bears an uncanny uh, resemblance to Artie Ziff from The Simpsons. Uh, and then they they interview each other, which I think is I don't think it's we've a ever first had for us. No, no, a, an interview between two people without the presenter presence no which i thought was very interesting it's it's quite hard to ex explain without you seeing this because what 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 is a fairly you know normal segment descends into madness when this meeting of minds occurs and we see what the two men are wearing it is astonishing it is truly <laughs> amazing i I've, I've written it down there's no way i won't be putting this on twitter or on instagram so so please do have a look i think they're both was it at tw order time there will be visual evidence out there because i mean we meet professor and i was wondering actually you say gamov and I, that, that would be how i pronounce it but in general americans don't yeah. tend to do the v for a w but from the research it's definitely yeah. gamov yeah. All right, good. So we meet Professor Gamov, who is a middle-aged gentleman, you know, I'd say, what, late 40s, early 50s. I think really sweet. He can pronounce his R's, which I find instantly endearing. He just seems like a really lovely guy. He's dressed in a, in a perfectly decent grey two-piece suit. He's obviously dressed up smart because the BBC are in town. Probably not used to being on TV all that much. Perfectly normal, perfectly reasonable. We then get introduced to Dr. Arnie Baker, who is... I think, very used to being on TV, thinks he's a bit of a character. And w they meet in this hotel. And <laughs> we've already met Professor Gamov. <laughs> we know what he looks like. And for some well, reason... I'll, we I'll, see tell, this... I'll tell you who Gamov looks like, Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gamov, yes, mind. Gamov looks exactly like Bigfoot from Bigfoot and the Hendersons. Oh, Have you ever yeah, seen yeah. the film Bigfoot and the Hendersons? Which in America was called Harry and the Hendersons. The, uh, the, well, the John Lithgow Biff, Bigfoot well, The program, film was film. Bigfoot and the Hendersons. The, the TV program was Harry and the Hendersons because John Lithgow wasn't in the, in the TV program. So but, they're two, they are two different things, I think. No, no. In, the, oh, in no? America, the, fil the film was called Harry and the Hendersons as well. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. Because oh. Harry's, oh, wow. Harry's the name of the big. Harry's oh, the name of, of the, the Bigfoot. Big yeah. Oh, I thought it was the TV. Yeah. Pro well, maybe because the TV program came over here and it was called Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah, oh, yeah. But he looks exactly. He and can like, I just say, like Bigfoot. 
to my mind, he looked. Professor Gamov also looks like he'd give you a really good hug. Because because when we meet <laughs> yeah, him, yeah. either he's really tall or Dr. Baker is really short or a combination of both. But we've seen Gamov. We know what he looks like. And, and here he comes striding in in this, exactly the same. He hasn't gone home to change in exactly the same suit. But now, perched on his head, he has a comedically... He's wearing a cowboy hat yeah. with a bolo tie drawstring <laughs> on his normal suit. And and we're not supposed to notice it. This is just his going out. But the thing is, it doesn't fit him. Like it's 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 like a gag. It's perched on his giant head. It is perched but on it... his giant head. It reminded me of of the little hat Adebisi wore in Oz. It's like it's that kind of little the way it's just like it's kind of gripping onto the side of his head miraculously because like the the bolo tie drawstring that's not being employed. It's it's just like yeah, <laughs> it's astonishing. That's how we meet, and then the camera pans over, and there's little. <laughs> Dr. Arnie Baker, who, in that way that some Americans can't dress properly, has a polo <laughs> neck t-shirt tucked in, really tucked in to some too large beige cargo shorts, which is bad enough. <laughs> the polo oh, yeah. shirt's got a giant, like, neon bicycle stitched onto the uh, yeah. breast of it. Yeah, l- l- lest we worry about what he might be interested in. But, but that, that's not what, what draws the eye. What draws the eye... <laughs> is remember he's wearing a bowler neck t-shirt buttoned up to the top and it needs to be buttoned up to the top because otherwise how is he supposed to wear his giant 1970s velvet self-tie bow tie rust <laughs> it looks like some sort of some sort of like rare tropical moth has landed on on him rather than, it's I, either nuzzling him or, or absorbing him it's gigantic it's huge I've, I've never seen a bow tie that large <laughs> Full stop. Let alone on a T-shirt. Is he having a laugh? Like, is he gone? Or is he? Is he looked at? Is he looked at Igor's bolo tie and gone? Oh, I should wear a tie as well. One of them didn't bring the other item on the chance that the other person was going to wear something stupid. They either arranged it or they literally turned up like this. And as the city is like, <laughs> are they actually taking the piss? Is this an elaborate joke? Because it is so so bizarre. It is, honestly, I mean, there's 18 episodes in, we've watched, I think we watched 20 because we've rejected two, I think, haven't we? And it's like, this is the weirdest thing I've seen so far. I've not seen anything <laughs> yeah. weirder than this. Yeah, so... Um, oh, we should but, actually yeah, talk the, about I what... Mean... <laughs> I was going to say we should talk about what's actually going on, shouldn't yeah. we? I think most people are aware of the of the concept. I, I remember we were, I'm pretty sure we were taught it at biology at school. The idea that that high altitudes you can improve athletes' performance because yeah. it, it basically makes you generate more blood, doesn't it? That's the whole idea. You get more red blood Cause, cells because it's less less oxygen yeah. up high. Yeah, so you get more red blood cells, and then when you go down low again, you've got like super blood. For one of a better Philippa, phrase, like yeah. Philippa, men- Philippa mentions that uh, uh, the US Olympic team. Basically, in in a previous Olympics, was it did you say it was the eighty four one or what was it? They they won nine gold medals because what they'd done is they just extracted a couple of pints of blood, waited for their blood to regenerate. This, this and then, blew my mind. I, I knew they had and then just. So she said, yeah. So they took out a liter of blood that they had used at altitude. Was it? They trained at altitude, took out a liter of blood, and then injected it into them before the races. And I don't know about you, but I just had this image of these like cyclists fit to burst. As yeah, they exactly. were going yeah. around, you know, it's like how, how do you fit, how do they fit an extra liter of blood into this? I don't system? know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought it was a bit of a closed loop. Like the amount of blood you have is the amount of blood you have, and here they are like shoveling in more. Astonishing. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, like just ugh, what if they crashed? Like there'd be blood everywhere, and you go like, <laughs> be oh, spurting he... everywhere. Wouldn't Absolutely. It? Yeah. And but then you'd be thinking like, no, no, just give them a few minutes, let them spurt <laughs> for before you put the tourniquet on. Uh, I wonder. I wonder if that is a. Do you think that is a po- like a potential? If you're going into a dangerous Potential situation, death trap. <laughs> but yeah. like like a prote- like a, mm. a like a strategy. If you're going into a da- dangerous situation where you may get cut badly, just inject yourself with an extra couple of pints of blood. Because then, even if you do get cut badly, it'll take longer for you to bleed out because you've already got a couple of extra pints inside you. What do you reckon? What's the scenario where you might get cut? I don't the, know. The, the, the dangerous lives. Juggling, I was going to say the dangerous uh, lives we live. It's most. It's most likely if we're going to be loading up a ream of paper into a photocopier. <laughs> That's it, really. Isn't I'm, not, it? I'm yeah. not suggesting that we'll be doing it, but I mean, oh, you know, just the, oh, yeah, yeah. Going into, the army. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. dueling or something. I don't dueling. Know. Okay. Um, yeah. Jousting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I agree with you, Russ, 100. percent Anyway, yeah. So, I uh, would oh, also uh, the uh, I noticed at the beginning that the, the drugs cheating is is illustrated by uh, a slow motion yeah. footage of Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson in the background, the Canadian yeah. sprinter who famously got done for I don't know what drugs he'd taken, but in in 1987, 
uh, at the Olympics. Uh, and I was thinking, I was, yeah. I was, I was, I was 88, sorry. Yep. 88, yeah, of course, yeah. I, th- I was thinking he must have breathed a bit of a sigh of relief when Lance Armstrong came around and Ben Johnson was no longer the poster boy for, for drugs cheating. Or, or, yeah. maybe, or maybe he feels, you know, maybe he feels, you know, he's, he's out of the limelight now. He, he, he wishes he was still, uh, you know, the world's number one drugs. I don't know. Do you want to tweet at him and see what he says? Yeah, <laughs> That's a good well, question. Well. Would you be sad or would you be... He'll always be remembered, but not by anyone much younger than us. Because no. that name, he's um, iconic. And now he's, absolutely. It's a good, it's a good although, question. Although, yeah. although, although I heard that apparently... Where did I hear this? I heard this recently. That apparently Cole Lewis was definitely all um, yeah. on drugs as well, but he just got away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know... I, I can't remember, but like, there was a documentary about that race on BBC4 during lockdown, probably probably a repeat. And it was something like, of the eight finalists, seven of them ended up being found guilty of cheating at some point or another in the following five, six years. So, you know, he, he got caught. I mean, that that was his problem. I mean, I, I think, if memory serves me correct, it, it wasn't that, like, he was the only one cheating. It was that, like, uh, he had taken it at the wrong time and it hadn't flushed out of his system. Mm. So, you know, there mm. you go. Bad luck. Get, get a calendar next time. You know, it, it, that's what everyone, <laughs> everyone else invested in a in, in, in a calendar uh, and you unfortunately forgot. Mm. It, and that was the difference between between a gold medalist and a name that will forever be remembered. Yeah. I don't know whether this is a controversial opinion, Mark, but uh, my, my opinion <laughs> is that they should be allowed to cheat as much as they like. There should be no cheating. They should just be able to do whatever they want to themselves. Because there's a limit of of the amount that a human body can take, isn't there? So that's mm. that's a that's the limiting factor in any sort of sport, regardless of how many steroids you take or whatever. So why not just let them do it? Just and just and just see how extreme and you know superhuman these people can make themselves. It, it think... make it surely make it far more interesting if we've got a load of absolute freaks doing absolutely mad things and smashing records left, right and centre and looking like absolute lunatics and dying of heart attacks at the age of 35. That's that's surely a much more interesting uh, I think, um, spectacle for all concerned. You're not the first person to suggest this. I would say that I've always thought like that, that the Olympics are every four years. Look, you could do it right in the middle and, and clean yourself over the next Olympics. I think it would be hugely entertaining. I'm struck by two things. One, I definitely think it should still be under medical supervision. I don't think you can just have at it. Let them go hog wild. <laughs> in a CVS pharmacy and just pick up everything and just see what works. I don't like that idea. You know, as long as like you're not putting robot legs in, because that's a different event and we can watch that separately, mm. then there is something well, to be said the, about... that's the Robot Olympics, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Robot Olympics. You're absolutely right. Yeah, just please, no kids in the audience. <laughs> Look, it's not that kind of show. You know, as long as you're not like using, you know, enhanced limbs made with electronics, you ultimately, you, you know, if you run 100 metres in 8.9, seconds because you <laughs> drugged up to the eyeballs you still are the fastest person he's ever run ever yeah. I, I don't disagree with that though i am mindful of the fact that you have to be careful because like things like the javelin the javelin they use now is very different to the one they used 15 20 years ago because mm. the one they use 15 20 years they can throw like 140 meters which is definitely into the stands so you have to be very careful about <laughs> about the throwing sports okay because you know there are there are there are children watching and it, it, you remind me of something else was that I, I read it on twitter again and I, I don't know if it's the same person who keeps tweeting it the other alternative is like okay maybe maybe you know similar but different is like uh i think it's like at nbc please can you fix it so at the next olympics in every final there is one normal person competing so we can see how truly good they are <laughs> Oh, that's a great idea. That's a great yes. idea, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. you know, so I'd love that. Like, and it's almost like it's not like it's not like a normal person is like, oh yeah, they're an amateur athletic uh, athlete. It's like, no, 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 let, no, let, just an everyday person. Uh, yeah, an everyday person pulled off the street says, right, congratulations, you're a finalist in the hundred meters final. You might win. <laughs> you never know. Whoa, I might win. <laughs> yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. there is yeah. something to be said about the the, the the cheesy Olympics and just kind of like let, let letting it go, but. It's interesting because have we even talked about what the thing is? That, I don't know if we have. Well, yet. that's the thing. I think we need to get back to that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I, I have think, an I think people could probably work out what it yeah. is. It's a it's a hyperbaric bed. It's a, it's a it's, he, he's created a bed in a tube that you can pressurize so that athletes when they're sleeping in it, it's like they're asleep at altitude. I think a maximum of fifteen thousand. I'm assuming he says feet. Uh, yeah, fifteen thousand meters is quite a long way up. Fifteen thousand feet. Um, and the idea is that while you're asleep, if you can get asleep in this, uh, while your ears are popping, apparently the same reaction is happening in your with the red blood cells as would be happening if you were training at, at altitude. Which you know, a lot of marathon runners go off to Kenya and they train at altitude. 
altitude. Uh, like the cycling team often go off to South America to train at altitude for for this just reasons. The idea is like, well, you know, to go to your point that you made in the um in the in the notes, you know, the fact that there are people out there who can train at altitude is really cruel on the good people of the Netherlands exactly, who, who, yeah. who don't get any benefits, you know, like if they what do they do? Are they supposed to train upstairs on the first floor? I, I don't know <laughs> and I did wonder, is like, is that why they're so tall? Is it their body reaching <laughs> reaching for just an extra foot of, of so they can get, blast themselves with, with red blood? So that, that's what it is and uh, Dr. Arnie Baker has spent $10,000 and he, he has his own at home which is interesting. Mm. It's a very simple premise. It's a very simple thing. To me, it was curiously passed because, like, Philippa talks about how, like, this could be seen as cheating. Is this cheating? And I thought, well, it isn't. I, I, actually, I think Arnie Baker lays out very clearly why it isn't cheating. It's like, is it cheating for people to train in Mexico? No. Is it cheating for people to be born and live in Mexico? A city, I should say. No, it's mm. not. The issue here is the one that goes to your cheesy Olympics ideas. It's about, especially when it comes to things like cycling, what made Team GB so good is that they focused on tiny margins they focused on the idea that if you can get like a fraction of a percentage of performance imp improvement by having different element of the bike made from a different material it all adds up to just enough probably to win the issue is that they were able to do that because you know because of the way olympic sports are funded in the uk they chucked tens of millions of dollars at it and so at some point the question is not that this is a cheating, but is it fair that well-resourced nations or organizations can pay 10 grand for everyone to have a pressurized bed when mm. other nations who may have better or worse athletes doesn't know, you know, we won't know, can't afford it. No. And that that is not mentioned here. And I think that's the really interesting question about, especially the Olympics, because it is, you know, although they're, all, they're mostly professional or all professional, it is still, you know, an amateur sport in the sense that at the end of it, you don't win prize money you get a medal and you get plaudits mm. but you don't actually no one gives you any money uh, from the olympics you might get money from your national olympic authority they or may go eBay, like ebaying your medals or ebaying your medals though i think most people this will shock you russ most people tend to hold on to them <laughs> <laughs> but this this is you know i, I was fascinated they don't really look into that and that, that to me is is what's really interesting about this is like it's not about cheating it's, it's about fair and then the whole thing goes off the tracks because these idiots turn <laughs> up in clown outfits just for the purposes of um, making a note of these things, it's our first spotting of coloured lights in a oh, yes. darkened laboratory, yeah. which is one of our favourite little first things. First but not here. last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Igor, Igor's pressure tank is seems to be in like sort of like a d darkened sort of warehouse with a it's but with with a swinging sort of naked yeah <laughs> yeah very odd. Uh, if, if i was philip i'd be a bit scared to uh clamber in that for the night plenty of room for somebody else in there i think so this is quite a extraordinary i uh, basically on my research mark uh, i spent about two hours alone on professor rustam igor gamov rustam igor gamov what a great name yeah First and foremost, he is the son of an extremely famous scientist called George Gamov, who was one of the original people who came up with the Big Bang Theory of the Universe. Ooh. He also uh, helped Crick and Watson with the discovery of the structure of DNA. Wow. So, Busy boy. so Gamov is top of the shop in terms of scientific surnames. Yeah, that's a period. legacy to live up to. Yeah, they're, they're Russian, Russian family. They're both George Gamov and uh, Mrs. Gamov, who was a ballet dancer. Both Russians, but they exiled to the United States. But this year, Igor here, as he liked to be known, uh, he was born in nine, uh, November 1935, and he, he only died. He died in April last year. Oh, okay. But he has quite a colourful career. He became a ballet dancer at 17, following in his mum's footsteps. So can you imagine this fella, this big foot? He, he, he looks like a galump. So, a galump. so <laughs> no, I cannot so, imagine yeah. at all that. He's very <laughs> awkward and huge. Yeah. He then had a few different jobs, including um, a job breaking in horses and karate teacher. <laughs> And he also became a motorcycle courier at one, and at one point he was a motorcycle courier in Washington D.C. And in 1956 he uh, hit the headlines in Washington D.C. because he would ride around on his his big Indian motorcycle. That's what they're called, Indian. Is oh, the company. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Big Indian motorcycle, uh, and he used to ride around Washington D.C. with an Alsatian sitting on the <laughs> petrol tank in front of him. And one day he collided with a cab. 
the, I think the cab pulled out and it was something like that, and he collided with it, and the Alsatian went flying off and went through the windscreen of the cab. Oh. However, Alsatian was completely uninjured oh. by all accounts. Igor got a small cut on him, and that was it. But it, what ended up happening is that they ended up suing each other. So the cab driver sued him, and he countersued the cab driver. Mm-hmm. In the end, Igor came to a settlement and got the cab driver had to pay him $500 for uh, damage to his bike and, you know, I don't know scaring the dog or something yeah. like that because Igor managed to prove that it wasn't dangerous to ride around Washington, D.C. with an Alsatian on the petrol tank. So that, that's, that's, that's the first time he sort of hit the headlines there. But then, then he decided to become a bit more sensible and following his father's footsteps. So his father was a lecturer at University of Colorado. So that's where Igor went as well. And he studied and became a biologist and microbiologist, which is what he got his qualifications in, which is quite interesting because obviously this chamber doesn't really have anything to do with, I suppose, a kind of understanding how the human body works Mm. is sort of connected in a way. He became quite famous on campus because uh, during the day he would uh, ride around on his motorbike. But at at night he would ride around on an Arabian stallion called Pegasus. (laughs) Jesus Christ. This this is a life fully led, isn't it? Yeah, so he became quite, you know, quite notorious around campus. But he was, and this is quite interesting, you know, as I said, he looked like Bigfoot. This is even more evidence he looked like he's some sort of uh, yeti creature because he he was a keen outdoorsman and mountaineer. This is why he became interested in the whole concept of altitude and things like this. So he established an altitude laboratory at the, at the university and started a program where he would take students to the Himalayas in Nepal uh, <laughs> once a year and he would teach them a course in high altitude physiology. So obviously the best place to go is the Himalayas mm-hmm. for that sort of thing. Also probably quite a, nice little, yeah. quite a nice little jaunt every yeah. year to do that. But yeah, so he established this altitude laboratory called the uh, BAT lab. I don't know what that stands for. But during during this time, so he, he, he then built this thing that Philip is sitting in, which he nicknamed the bubble. That was capable of, in this case now, what he's doing is he's getting rid of the pressure in it. But his initial idea was to increase the pressure because his original invention was something to treat altitude sickness mm. and to treat altitude sickness you have to increase the pressure so that it tricks the body into thinking it's lower on lower grounds mm. that was the original idea. and then from that he invented a thing which is even now known as the gamov bag which is a piece of emergency equipment that mountain rescuers can use and it's it's basically a bag version of the thing that Philip is in. So you can take up the so somebody's got altitude sickness and up a mountain, you can go up there, stick him in this giant bag, seal it up, and then pump it up to pressure, and then it will make them feel like they're they're going the lower altitudes, and it will help cure their altitude sickness, and you know, it's very good, save them from getting strokes or whatever it is that you know that causes. It was such a successful product that Sir Edmund Hillary himself wrote a letter to Gamov commending him on uh, you know saving mountaineers' lives. It's been used plenty of times apparently, but then yeah, so he got the inventing bug. So he also invented a new type of scuba equipment for shallow water, which he called Suba. Uh, which is basically some sort of pressurised snorkel thing. He invented some sort of special trainers that can return the energy to your to your feet or something like that. And then he also invented a special orthone- orthopaedic knee brace, which can help people with arthritis and bad knee injuries, helps them to still be able to climb. So all of this is... Wow. There's a whole documentary yeah. about him and his parents on YouTube called The uh, Galloping Gamovs, it's called. I think it's a self-made documentary. It's about an hour and a half. I've not watched it yet, but uh, might be worth watching. So all good, Mark. This is all exciting, is it? Yeah, Very yeah, good, yeah, great yeah. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a character. Yeah. Unfortunately. Oh, I knew there was a butt. Oh. <laughs> I knew there was something. You know, you said, did you say he looks like a man who gives great hugs? Yeah, I did say that. <laughs> mm, I think he might be giving a few too many hugs, Mark. Oh. Un- what's a few unwanted hugs, oh. I would say. Yeah, he's he's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a sex pest. That's the problem, or was a bit of a sex pest. If, if we're talking scale here, Mark, yep. is it a scale that many of our listeners will probably understand? He's very much on the DLT end of the scale yep. rather than the Jimmy Savile end of the scale. Okay, yeah. But yeah, no, he, he, he never actually properly got done for anything in terms of like criminal. Yeah. But he did get sacked by the university in 2004 for moral turpitude. <sighs> Phrase. What? What is what, uh, turpitude? I've never actually looked up the word turpitude, mm. but I've only ever heard it in relation to the phrase moral, moral turpitude. turpitude. Yeah. It's one of those things I know what it means, but yeah, 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 I, I yeah. don't know what it means. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, but so, but apparently, there's there's allegations stretching back to the 80s, and 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 it sort of came out May the fourth, 2006. So oh. just yesterday in 2006. Yeah. 
Uh, By the way, Russ, uh, polls have closed, so oh, well, yeah, it's too late to get your vote in now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just 10 o'clock here. And we Already I feel like we live in a very, very different country. Damn it, I was going to put my X in the box for Veritas as well. <laughs> um, but but what, what came out of this, so this court case that concluded just this week in 2006, I read about it in a, in a local Colorado newspaper, which had the headline, The Smutty Professor, which I thought was quite, <laughs> Ooh, very good. I thought it was quite good. Yeah. But uh, basically what happened, he, he, had this lo- he had this lab assistant called Dana, and she'd worked with him for a long time. And it turned out he'd been, you know, all sorts of nasty things with her. But what she did is that she brought a suit against the university yeah. that he worked for, because she said that for years, people had been like making allegations against him. and The university hadn't done anything about it. Yeah. So she sued the university for, rather than suing him, which presumably would require a higher amount yeah, of evidence yeah, yeah, or something yeah, like that, yeah. she sued the university to say that they didn't act when they should have done yeah. uh, back in the 90s when all of the allegations were first coming out. And she won. She won $285,000 in damages. So I think it's just a case, you know, universities tend to do this, don't they? They sweep, they sweep these things under the carpet mm. a lot. But there is, I just, there is one thing I wanted to... Because he's, he, like, as with all sex pests, all, all good sex pests, Mark, he completely vis- vociferously denies any wrongdoing. Of course. And uh, there's also, there was, all in there's, quite, us. there's quite a few sort of letters to the editor and essays he's written saying that, oh, you know, it's all perfectly innocent. Yeah. So, you know, I just, just put my arm round her friendly and all things yeah. like that. Misconstrued. Misconstrued and yeah. things like that. But I thought that this, this I, I, one... If anything, I'm just guilty of, of loving too much. <laughs> Being just too good a friend. There's, a, there's just a couple of details here that I thought were particularly oh. odd, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read this 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 paragraph. Um, right, so Gamov was called to the stand to give his side of what he thought his relationship was with this assistant, right? Yeah, and he he described her as a dear friend who had helped him with back problems by manipulating his spine and with impotence by masturbating him <gasps> and providing him with porn. It was all consensual and therapeutic in nature, he said. It was fairly normal for him to seek such services from a friendly female employee, he explained. (laughs) After all, this particular assistant was a qualified uh, vet and therefore had extensive training in animal husbandry. What? Wow. (laughs) How is that a defence? Wow. Well, it's not, is it? (laughs) I mean, I I guess he is a Bigfoot. (laughs) Is that it? What What a bizarre thing to say on the stand. Well, worse than that, he probably believes it, or he believed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You wouldn't say that with yeah. a straight face if you thought that was gosh. so weird. Anyway, yeah. So that was a shame because I thought, oh, I thought we'd really come across a, you know, a proper a proper character that was worth celebrating. Yeah. And he's 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 gone no. with, so many of our favourite characters. Wither he's, our heroes, Russ. He's yeah, really scuzzed it up at the end there. But yeah, so talking of which, Arnie Baker. <laughs> okay. Barney Baker, not nearly as bad, not nearly as bad. However, I thought the interesting thing about him was that uh, he's an incredibly successful uh, cycling trainer. He's got his own Wikipedia article. He coached like several Olympic Games teams, apparently. Does he have one coach for the team? I guess they have one coach for the team, don't Mm -hmm. they? Yeah, but he's involved in that. But uh, despite being Canadian, seems to have taught mostly mainly Americans. Um, He's written loads of books on the subject, but he was in the news because he was involved in the defence of the one who isn't on Lance Armstrong, Floyd, Floyd Landis. Landis. Yeah, yeah, he was involved in the defence of him, and a French court gave Arnie a twelve-month suspended sentence because he used documents obtained by hacking in his defence. Oh, um, okay, yeah. But Arnie is Arnie is always strenuously denied that he had any any wrongdoing involved. Okay, and he didn't know he didn't know that they were illegally obtained documents. So. Who knows? So who knows whether who knows whether Arnie is a expert computer hacker or, or an innocent bystander? But there's absolutely no. But he was found guilty. The, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, no explanation for the bow tie whatsoever. I, I mean, he serves a twelve month <laughs> suspended sentence for that, really, doesn't he? Suspended. To be <laughs> I mean, I, I can imagine the judge putting the black cloth on their wig, but I fear he'd whip it off and turn it into another bow tie. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's the characters, really. I mean, there's nothing real I can say about the altitude training. That oh, I know she's. Well, there is one thing I could say about it. Is that the whole reason it came about as a, like a, as a thing to study and think about was because of the Mexico City Olympics mm. in 1968. They noticed that uh, in all of the endurance events, like marathon running or the long distance running events, 
all of the red no nobody broke any records whatsoever because obviously they you know it's harder to run up in the thin air but in the sprinting events they smash loads of records because you sprinting is so short they don't need any extra oxygen to be able to sprint and the air's thinner so they you know there's less there's less air resistance so once they noticed that that's how they, they started studying this whole idea of altitude as Philippa discusses, it's it's to do with the amount of uh, haemoglobin in the blood and things like that. The only interesting thing being that there's a development in Finland. The Finns have gone way ahead of this this chamber that Philip is in. Oh yeah, they've made uh, a special high altitude house. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a full house that the that the athletes live in, and when they're indoors, it's like they're living up a mountain, and then they just come outside and train outdoor outside the house. It's like some sort well, of they, weird... There you go. They're way ahead of us. They are, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It, what a disappointment that was. But it was it was a real roller coaster ride reading about it. Yeah. Did, did you read it in chronological order? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, oh I was, gosh. I got all excited about his dad and the Big Bang and all that. And the Arabian thought, Stallion. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Arabian Stallion. And then... Oh, oh wow. Animal wow. husbandry. Yeah. Still to come, the contraceptive pill for men. Does Eastern science hold the answer? And Clash of the Titans. Has Kasparov finally met his match? Do you know who I really admire? Those people who can chat away in several different languages. Frankly, whenever I'm abroad, I always seem to end up with my fingers glued to a dictionary. Well, there's good news for all of us linguistically challenged. News that comes all the way from Israel. We've left Jez Nelson stranded in the heart of Jerusalem and we've swapped his dictionary for a magic pen. It's my first day in Jerusalem and they've set me a challenge. I've got to find my way out of this bustling Friday fruit market, negotiate a route through the old city to the Wailing Wall, and then by five o'clock make it to the promenade for a meeting with a guy. I don't speak the language and all they've given me is this tiny guidebook and this rather nifty looking device, which they say is going to help me. Oh well, here goes. In my Tomorrow's World travels, I've been lost in some pretty exotic places, but Jerusalem beats them all. Here I don't stand a chance, because all the signs are in Hebrew. My guidebook tells me that the proper name for the Wailing Wall is in fact the Western Wall. But what it doesn't show is what the name for the Western Wall looks like in Hebrew. And of course, just my luck, I can't find anyone who speaks English. Excuse me, uh, can you tell me the way to the Western Wall? I think it's time to put my new device to the test. It's a remarkable scanning pen which can read words in English and then translate them into Hebrew. When I swipe the pen over the word Western, the letters are grabbed by an optical scanner and pop up on an LCD display. Then a tiny but powerful computer recognises the word and translates it. It only does a word at a time, so I have to scan in wall separately. But with a 400,000 word database, the pen should be able to handle it. I wonder what the Hebrew is for rubbish invention, Mark. <laughs> Now, I know you don't think this is necessarily rubbish for the sake. <laughs> no, it's not. No. It's not rubbish. At all. What I would say is I think it's a nifty bit of technology that when, if you try to use it much in the real world, yes. would <clears throat> quickly lose its appeal because it's, it's quite unwieldy, isn't it, really? It, yeah. In the way it operates. What's it the same size of? He, he, a meat thermometer. Yeah, but all handle. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a large, chunky, heavy-looking pen. And the idea, if it doesn't come across, is that you scan a word and the little computer in the pen pulls up on the little laser display board on the handle the, in this case, Hebrew translation for an individual word. And it obviously, there are two ways of looking at this. The first way is to look at it now and go like, well, it's just, just, you know, it's not rubbish. It's obviously very clever, but obviously it's incredibly impractical and you would soon lose patience. I mean, especially if you're trying to, I mean, if you were trying to work out what an item on a menu was and it was in Hebrew and you couldn't recognize simple words that indicated anything, you'd have to translate them all. 
And if it mm. was a complicated dish, you would probably spend a couple of minutes translating each individual word. You probably have to jot them down <laughs> really slow. Re really, I mean, he's lucky he's he's only trying to translate something as simple as the Western Wall. So there's that way of looking at it. Also, words ha have different meanings depending well, on what the words around Absolutely, there's are. no sense of context. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could be it could be a wall in the west. I mean, it could be the western wall of a local pub. Y you don't know. Whereas, like the western wall, the Wailing Wall might have a very different. Absolutely correct. Context is key to a lot of language. The other way is that if if I saw this in 1997, I would have been. It would have blown my socks off. I think not because the object itself is incredible, and it's clearly not the solution to a lot of problems or the issue that Jez has. But, but like to my mind, my dad had a pound pilot, and before he had a pound pilot, he had one of those kind of little mini. It was about the size of a mobile phone now, and it had a little like, like an electronic organizer. Electronic organizer. We had one. We had a really good one that came with like a, a version of Word. I absolutely could see how this pen and the technology in it, the idea that you could be somewhere, type out a message, and it would come up with a translation. You can see the possibilities are endless. It is so mm. odd that the guy who, um, he hasn't even invented it, the guy who's hawking it is indicating that this is basically, this is the product you need. Well, of course it isn't. But what it is, you, can, you, you feel the gates of innovation opening and the possibilities mm. a ahead. That's why I really found this really interesting because in 1997, I think I would have been hugely impressed because like even, even now when I go abroad, uh, abroad, you know, I still feel a little bit of anxiety about the fact that I don't really speak the language. Google Translate is amazing. The fact that you can h hold your camera in front of words in a foreign language and it comes up with a, often, you know, a pretty decent translation or the fact that you can speak into it. And it will translate it and then chuck out the words. I mean, as I was saying in the notes, myself and Josie, we were in a, a sake bar somewhere off the beaten track. And, and you know, we were, luckily you could just go around and like pick numbers <laughs> for your little flight of sake. But this guy came over with a specific translation device and we mm. had a conversation and it was just incredible. It was really, he was delighted. He was wondering why we were there and he was really pleased to see us because, you know, we're not, this wasn't Osaka or Tokyo or something like that. It was sort of slightly in the middle, but like somewhere people didn't stop. And we were just, it was really, it was kind of, it was fantastic. And, and you know, you kind of feel like in 10 years time, that technology could be so perfect that, you know, it's not that you won't need to learn a language. Of course you will. You should always learn a language. We won't, but you should. And and <laughs> anyone who does will always feel the benefit for, from it. But the idea that actually you really will be able to kind of go around and translate stuff or, or just get by and like really, anyway, getting away from the point, this pen feels like the beginning of a journey. And I think I would have seen that in 1997. With the benefit yeah. of hindsight now, obviously it's rotten. <laughs> it's, you know, it's absolutely <laughs> like he is slowly scanning this pen over the words backwards as well, like it, which is counterintuitive because obviously, as I said, like Hebrew is right to left, not left to right. So it's designed clearly. It's designed Israel. So obviously, the, to them, yeah. it, the natural flow of the pen goes across the page, which would you and I would get stuck all the time, <laughs> forgetting which way to do the pen. And of course, it, it only does one word at a time. <laughs> Also, and the other, oh, go on. Go on. No, no. I was, no, I was just saying. I just wonder how how it, how it copes with fonts. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, I had. I assumed it must be the. Yeah, no, you're right. Was, actually, yeah. It was looking at the letter because it, it's a thing called OCR, optical character recognition. Obviously, these days it will recognise anything, but but I just don't know how sophisticated that would have been back then for it to be able to would it be able to read times new roman and a couple of other an aerial and then if you if you chucked it like comic sans at it it would just yeah. know what it was or wingdings or, yeah and actually are there different hebrew fonts i don't know that's a good is question like a comic, is there a comic sans of hebrew yeah i, I equally when i when it's in japan like because the written language is so different to european languages Again, it's, you know, it all looks the same. So it's very difficult to work out whether there are completely different fonts. Whereas like, I, I don't know, we feel, obviously, I suppose, because we know that we recognize the words, but even when you go to the consonant, you recognize that there are completely, just so many different types of fonts, hmm. each conveying uh, a different message. I mean, there's, there's nothing more, you know, eye roll inducing than like a, a really urgent or angry uh, message that's written in Comic Sans, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you just can't take anything seriously. It's like, I, I and I, I was thinking the same thing about the Japanese. Like, like, is it the same? Like, do they have? It's, it's so difficult to work out. What, mm. you, of course, they must do absolutely. But it, it just are they limited? Are, are, are there more? It's it. It's you know, it's something I've always been fascinated about.
about. Do they have the same array? Like, is there a font that they use that people just go like, "What? You're an idiot. Why have you done that?" You know? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I have no idea. I, I, obviously, this pen in 1997, I you know it, it must have only surely only a kind of a limited tranche of okay, most fonts are you know broadly a variation of the theme but mm. know, yeah that's a good question the thing they've set jess nelson here jess nelson who really is looking at even thinner than he did uh, last, mm. last time he's looking very thin th- like i mean obviously he's not wearing a giant what's it called uh, he's not wearing a sleeping giant bag. sleeping bag <laughs> yeah. this time so but he really does look like he's, he's liable to to mug you for your quictionary to to sell it for some skag frankly I think it's a strange challenge to have because the thing he's looking for is called the Western Wall. Yeah. And he's in the middle of the city. And I don't know about you, I'm I'm no Ray Mears, right? But if I was going to look for the Western Wall and I was in the middle of a city, I'm pretty sure I'd know which direction to start walking. Well, I think you've made a huge error there, Ross. I'll I'll tell you why, because... The building could be in the east. It would still have a western wall. <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, it's not. It's not the western wall of the city, then. Is it? No, is it? it's it's the western wall of. Isn't it the original Jewish temple that is on Saint David's Mount in Jerusalem? It's, oh, it's I don't yeah. Know. No, no. It's, it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's a religious site. It's not a. It's not, it's not a boundary. <laughs> <You know? laughs> See, I, I would have just. Put, I would have just started walking west. And yeah. No. I, I, yeah. I, I, and, I, I read and, down and, the notes, Russ, and, and I thought, listened out. For, yeah. Listened out for the wailing. <laughs> <laughs> He was saying, no, you're going the wrong way. Um, <laughs> my, my, what I was focusing is on, like, my, my feeling is that if you go to Jerusalem and you ask for the Western Wall, people are generally going to know where the Western Wall is. It's a bit like being in Soho and asking someone where Trafalgar Square is, right? Even if someone says, excuse me, where is El Squero Trafalgaro? It's like, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Leave me alone. <laughs> you're going to go like, oh, you want your... Okay, okay, over there. The other thing is that he, he, he says at the beginning, is like, he, he basically implies that like Jerusalem is uniquely difficult for him to get around because of, because, because of Hebrew, which we were discussing earlier. It's uniquely difficult. Of all the places he's gone, Jerusalem is uniquely difficult. And I, I'm going to put this out there. My understand. I've not been to Israel. My understanding is that English is it's <laughs> incredibly highly spoken language, and the written word is everywhere. Like you will get your way around. Is you know, hmm. don't worry about it. We, we got your back on this one. Also, <laughs> again, I cannot stress this enough. If you're trying to find the Western Wall, they will point where you need to go. Yeah. I, I just yeah. that that bit really annoyed me. <laughs> really annoyed. The thing is, like you know. <laughs> It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm in Jerusalem. I've never been here before. Talking about Ray Mears, he basically seems to imply he's been dropped in the middle of an urban jungle. And, you know, the only thing between him and starvation is this pen. <laughs> uh, am, am, I, uh, am I exaggerating? Yes, but not by much. So over the course of our watching so far, we've had two translating technologies covered. There's this one, which mm-hmm. is the, which is invented by people speak Hebrew, mm-hmm. write in Hebrew. And then the previous one was the one that was invented by people in Japan. Mm-hmm. And I was just, and who of course use Japanese script, whatever that's called. Is that kanju? Called? Is kaiju? Kan- kaiju? Kan- kan- no, kai- kanju? Kaiju? No, Kaiju are the giant oh, creatures. Kaiju is yeah. Kaiju's Godzilla. Kan- it? Kanju, I think kanju, it is, yeah. Kanju, Kanju. <laughs> yeah. And I just wondered, do you think that there is a more of an impetus to uh, developing these translating things if you don't use the same alphabet? The European alphabet. The European alphabet. I'm sure it probably has a proper name, but yeah, the European alphabet. Uh, is there an impetus? There has to be, doesn't there? I, I think it's probably more of a... Well, the example, he, the, the guy who, again, he hasn't invented this, but he, he's the one hawking it. The example he gives is that the son of the inventor came to him and said, Dad, because he was struggling with his English, said, Dad, why isn't there a pen that you can scan to translate it? I suppose my feeling is like uh, somebody who, who, who learned a bit of Spanish and French through the years. I, I don't suppose you'd look at the written, you know, French in its written form and go like, I'll never be able to work this out. I just don't even know where to begin. It's like, there's going to be a few words you recognize. All mm. the, it's all the same letters. Yeah, I think you're probably absolutely right. Yeah, I think that has to be it. It's like, you know, you, you need a way, you need a way in. And it, yeah. this gives it to you. I mean, equally, you know, like, you know, the, the acrylic, I, I, I think we've mentioned this before, but I mean, when we were in, in Kiev, uh, one of the things that really impressed me was that, you know, you were half the time, like some kind of, you know, idiot savant. You were like, you're looking at all the signs, your head moving around rapidly. For days on end, I was thinking, what are you doing? And then you just pointed at the sign and said, notary. 
and you'd you'd basically you'd, you'd, you'd cracked the code like you yeah, you'd, I, was decode, yeah. I was trying to decode, decode the Cyrillic, the Cyrillic yeah, yeah. into uh, the European no there's there's as we all know they, have, they there aren't the same number of letters they don't have a Z for example as we all know now it's like and I was really impressed and then once you had cracked the code you were able to spot that you know obviously they have a lot of words that are very similar to ours just written in a different yeah uh, exactly yeah, yeah and yeah, you were like yeah. all over the place you're going like oh i know what that means i know and it's like it was brilliant you know that was i was really impressed um, and you did and you didn't have to rub my head across the side like, a, <laughs> no, like I, a I didn't i didn't i just did that <laughs> for my own amusement <laughs> This thing, it, we see the brand name on it, don't we? It's called the mm. Quictionary. Mm-hmm. Not to be it. confused, not to be confused with there's some sort of board game called Quictionary as well. Yeah, uh, I, just I remember. My, yeah, stumbled across my googling. No, 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 but, Rasta, um, don't, don't give away the game. You're a, you're a really serious <laughs> researcher. <laughs> Sorry, I stumbled across it in the in the library. When was, uh, <laughs> yeah, with my thumbs glued to the the, books the Royal as, Dutch as, as Library or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, manufactured by Wiscom Technologies. As we can see here, it was established in Jerusalem in 1995, this company. But then they, they moved to Massachusetts in the 2000s. Unfortunately, I tried to click on their website and their website has vanished. Oh. So I, it seems like they may not be around anymore. Possibly because Google have come in and uh, eaten their lunch, really, hasn't mm. it, haven't they? In many ways. But you can still buy their products, or at least... You can buy products branded Quictionary, which which appear to be the same sort of thing. But obviously, things have moved on since 1997. But if you go if you go on Amazon and uh, stump up 199 pounds, you can get delivered tomorrow the latest version of the Quictionary, which I think I think is actually probably about 10 years old. It's quite futuristic looking in comparison. It looks it's it's white. And it looks kind of like, like an iPod, maybe. A, what is it? Like a sort of the old touchscreen iPods, but crossed with a pregnancy test. It's still got the pointy pen bit at the bottom. This is the Quickie 2 Premium. Is it white with a touchscreen on it? No, this is, I mean, this, this is very much like the pen, actually. No, no. Currently well, unavailable. I just found it, yeah. It, it's definitely on there, Quictionary something. But it can do 112 languages in, oh. one, in one pen. Yeah. And oh, here we go. As yep. a, have you got it? Yep. And obviously, I think they've realised that the maybe the pen thing is a is a bit of a, of a dead end. <laughs> so they've added voice and mm. camera functionality to it. If they've done that, how often is the pen bit used? Do you think? Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> It's, a bit, it's it's almost like a stubborn thing to just leave that on there. There's a five it? star like, review sort of here. This is this isn't on Amazon. There's a five star review here, and uh, just bear, bear in mind what we just said. The title is uh, exactly what I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Try and think of a job where you just need to be able to translate one word at a time. It's not that you only need to translate one word at a time. It's that you're not allowed to translate any other words. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, because obviously, if you use your Google Translate, it'll show you all the words around. It's like, no, that's unacceptable. We just need you to. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe if you're redacting foreign language material or something like that, <laughs> or translating redacted yeah. material, that's the closest I can think to an example where the the quick pen, the Quictionary pen, would come into use. It did slightly remind me of those, you know, those Tipex. Yeah. Those tip-ex, yeah, yeah. Tipex yeah. mouse. I always yeah, found yeah. them very satisfying. The the I think you call it Tipex mouse, don't you? Where you yep. just draw it across the words yeah. and they disappear under the little ribbon of white Tipex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, always great fun. Oh, and that fella, that that, that fella you said you kept mentioning the one who's flog trying to flog it to us. Yeah, looks, can't he's remember got the his name actually. Half, yeah, it's, it's David Gal. Yep. Who's like the top half of his head looks like Paul Simon, the bottom half of his head looks like James Woods. These days, he's still he's still going around, he still lives in Jerusalem, but he's the chairman of Scanmaster Ultrasonic Inspection Solutions. So he's an ultrasound baron, Mark. An ultrasound baron. Okay. Yeah. Big ultrasound. Yeah, so, so obviously, yeah, he obviously jumped ship when he realised that there wasn't much in it and went to the much safer world of the extremely safe technology of ultrasound. We, Mark. we know it's safe. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, poor Jez. And now to that male pill story. Women have been taking the pill for over 30 years. So where on earth is the pill for men to take? Well, so far, the only male contraceptive drugs have meant either painful injections or have had unacceptable side effects. Well, the solution may come not from the laboratories of the West, but from the jungles of Thailand. Vivian Parry meets the Thai doctor who could hold the key to tomorrow's contraceptive. They're far from shy about contraception in Thailand. At this restaurant in Bangkok, male contraception has even made it onto the menu. Instead of, um, 
After dinner mints with your bill, you get a free condom. Family planning campaigns like the one at this themed restaurant have been very effective. Thai men are happy to use condoms and vasectomy is common, but like men everywhere else, they've never had a contraceptive drug that's as simple and effective as the female pill. Until now, that is. I'm travelling high up into the jungle-glad hills of northern Thailand on the trail of a scientist who may at last be on the brink of producing the elusive male pill. And the secret turns out to be a rare Chinese plant cultivated here in the Royal Botanical Gardens. Well, this is it. Tritoridium wilfordii, the thunder god vine. It's actually not all that impressive. But its roots are already used as a medicine in China, not for contraception, but in pill form for treating rheumatoid arthritis. And it was in China that doctors noticed a strange side effect. It made men who took it temporarily infertile. Thai researcher Dr Vishai Rotrakul is convinced that this arthritis remedy contains the key to a male pill. He's working with Chinese scientists and the World Health Organization testing the drug on rats to try and work out what's going on. What do you reckon the best nickname for condom is, Mark? I've always been a big fan of Rubber Johnny. I was going to say the same thing, the Rubber Johnny. Though I do, it's got to be Rubber Johnny, isn't it? I do enjoy uh, saying the word prophylactic. Or she <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah. that's not true. I, oh. I love saying she's. I, I like Alan Partridge saying yeah, she's. she's. Got yeah. she's. But a prophylactic is good, yeah. Uh, rubber Johnny yeah. is classic, isn't it? It's got to be Rubber Johnny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've never liked French letter. I know it didn't really make any, didn't really make no, any sense to me. That's old people and say I, that. It was only, only <laughs> fairly recently I discovered that scumbag is oh, yeah, old, Amer a, a, old American, old American slang phrase, condoms, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Scumbag. Yeah. So this is all about contraception although not of the not of the rubber johnny kind although kind of like a nice bit of symmetry for them in that they've gone to thailand to cover a a new contraceptive and it just so happens mm. that in thailand they have a condom themed restaurant mm. that they can sort of base everything around you know. should, we, should we should we drill into that restaurant for a moment should we just should we discuss that a little bit further <laughs> the, i think so i think because i think it's absolutely fascinating so, so Vivian starts off, she's in cabbages. This is Vivian Parry. Vivian, Vivian Parry. Parry who, who we've not seen before. Oh, and, no, uh, have we not? I, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't think no. we had, yeah. Vivian Parry starts off a piece. She's at Cabbages Condom Restaurant. Cabbages and condoms. Oh, cabbages condoms. and condoms. Oh, I didn't see the uh, I didn't see the Yes, yeah, so there's an and. Oh. Yes, yeah. Cabbages and Condom Restaurant, which she says is a condom-themed restaurant. This isn't like a pop-up. This isn't like when, you know, there's that Breaking Bad cocktail bar in your local town that pops up for two and a half weeks. This is a really large restaurant yeah. where there are condom-themed artworks in the wall. There's one where it seems to be 40 different types of condoms all kind of lined up in like five different washing lines. There's one where a guy, as you said, is, is holding a baby in one arm and either showing the victory <laughs> sign or flicking the Vs with his other arm. Um, Do you think he's regretting that he's not used the condom? Is that is that is that the message from that picture? <laughs> I, I couldn't work it out. Or that, like, you know, she wanted three, but I only there's only one, so you know, I, I win. Um, there's also condom themed carpet. I think that that's my favourite bit. Oh, the, condom, yeah. the the embroidered condom themed yeah, carpet, yeah, yeah. I think, is uh, is wonderful. It's got four um, different, different themed condoms. There's there's one where it's a, a tube where it's been like it looks like a folded up letter, and that's called the postman, right? Yep. There's one. Yep. Uh, is it with the with the red cross? Is that right? Which is the uh, orderly. Yes. There's 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 one that looks like the sleeve of a yes. of an admiral called the admiral. Oh, called the admiral. The, uh, and then with... and then. <laughs> Then there's the one that you're going to have in your special Veritas collection. Special, yeah, there's there's one with seemingly no theme that is titled simply Kilroy. <laughs> <laughs> so, what the hell is that exactly? Is Kilroy? Do they watch Kilroy? <laughs> because it, he would have been on in '96. <laughs> Does it mean yeah, something I, else? <laughs> I don't know. I've no idea. And it's it's kill it's actually not spelt the same as no, kill it's not. Robert Kilroy. It's it's spelt with double L. Yeah. So it's like like you're gonna um, kill Roy. <laughs> also doesn't make sense. Maybe maybe even makes less yeah. sense. I don't know. I've no idea. Actually, I probably should have researched that really. <laughs> Hang on. There's the old Kilroy was here thing from that was a thing in the Second World War, wasn't it? I, I don't remember. Yeah. I wasn't then I wasn't around then. <laughs> so there was uh, there was a thing in the Second World War 
where people would draw a man. Oh, right, well, yeah, yeah, a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Character with yeah. his nose going over yes. the edge of a wall. Is he called Kilroy? And it would say Kilroy was oh, here. I, I know there was here, and I remember the shape. I didn't know that it was called Kilroy. Or, so or maybe that that, that condoms were putting on his nose. Maybe that's it. Oh, do you think? Oh, do you know? Maybe. I mean, it makes more sense than it being named after Robert Kilroy Silk, the, 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 the tanned Veritas candidate. Yeah, the the biddy bodder of uh, daytime <laughs> TV. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I didn't know that was because I, I remember, like, yeah, I can remember seeing the was here, and I, you know, I think even you and I would have drawn those. But yeah, fair enough. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, I I'm fascinated. I don't know if if cabbage is is still a going concern, but it, like, well, Mark, I can tell, I can tell I, you everything. I was cabbages are leading into this, so <laughs> please do. So we're now 25 years later. Do tell. Huge, huge success, Mark. Wow. It is it is more successful than you can possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't doubt that. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a really nice story. It's So there's the, the a local philanthropist, a businessman, whose name I'm definitely not going to be able to pronounce correctly, but he's called uh, Mekai Viravidya. That's how I'll pronounce it. Might be Mechai, Meche. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce Thai. If only I had some sort of translation. I know, pen, I know, I, I know. I'm sorry, but they're just not available. But he, he, one day he said, you can go to any shop around Thailand and you will always find cabbages. Mm. Hmm. Condoms should be like cabbages, which are ubiquitous and accessible to everyone. So he made it his mission to completely remove the taboo around condoms, which was cool. at the time, because he was worried about, obviously worried about AIDS and yeah. you know, yeah, all yeah. these sorts of things yeah. and uh, unwanted pregnancies and things like that. So he, he set up this cabbages and condoms restaurant and it became so successful that uh, his name, Mechai, in Thailand is now the slang word for condom. Wow. So they don't say they don't say rubber Johnny. They say his name. But this restaurant is entirely non profit. So all of the profits go to his charity, which is to do with help giving condoms to people and, and, and educating people about sexual health and things like this. But it's it's huge successful and it's it's a decent restaurant and it's so successful that there's the big main restaurant in Bangkok, mm-hmm. which I presume is the one that we I'm see see, I'm here. assuming that must be, yeah. He also own, has four resorts across Thailand. Wow. All called Cabbages and Gundams. But this is the this is the one, Mark. There's another there's another one. <laughs> and it's in the Oxfordshire market town of Bista. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Yeah, yeah. There's a cabbages and condoms restaurant in Bista, and it has 4.4 out of five stars on Google. <laughs> really? Apparently, yeah, yeah. Main course is about twelve quid. Apparently, it's a really decent Thai restaurant. Uh, oh my has, God. Still has the, You're has right. the condom has the condom theme. But yeah, I mean, I, that was the last thing I was expecting <laughs> to come across. Bangkok, Chiang Rai, Koh Yai, Krabi, Pattaya. Ratchaburi Bister. <laughs> How incredible. I guess because there's that big there's that big outlet, isn't there, near the Bister Village, yeah. Bister's, yeah, yeah. Bister's, yeah, yeah. which so they attracts must... a lot of people Absolutely. Lot of people from the Far East. Yeah. So I don't know whether that it has to be sure somehow encouraged the, the decision to put it there. That's incredible. I love the fabulous font. Speaking of fonts, that the um name is in. Wow, I, I that is not what I was expecting to learn at all. Is this the revelation you were so excited about? Well, one of the many we've had today. That's incredible. Obviously, I don't really pass Bista very much these days, but uh, certainly if I'm if I, if the future I'm ever passing it, I'm absolutely guaranteed to pop in there and well, we get have myself a pad a pad tie or something. I feel like we have to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, let's get back to the sorry. The, let, let's get let's back get to back the to the meat in hand here. Alarm bells started ringing when, as soon as, as soon as Vivian said that this was going to be based on an ancient Chinese medicine, mm. because I I've made my opinions on quackery known previously. An ancient Chinese medicine is is very much it, it's not quite as quackery as uh, homeopathy in that they actually are using things, you know, <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so there's a there's obviously there is the you know you can accrue the wisdom over years of knowing which plants do what and that's that's all fair enough but i have a, I have a certain you know animosity towards it because it, so many endangered species are in da- are purely endangered because of ancient chinese medicine and it's usually to do with grinding up their penises mm. to uh for some sort of um fertility product mm. but in the, i think in this case we seem to have an actual scientist on the case 
who's looked at this ancient Chinese medicine and decided that there might be something actual scientific in it. Mm -hmm. And he's doing some proper experiments. And as we can see, because they're in a lab, and we know they're in a lab, don't we, Mark? Because, because it's, it's weirdly lit. With, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We know it's a lab. It must be working. So they've take, they found this, this plant wonderfully called mm. the Thunder God Vine. Which is tremendous, isn't which it? Is, which yeah. is a tremendous name for a plant, isn't it? Every time I hear it, I, my brain goes in the voice of Lion-O. Thunder. <laughs> thunder. <laughs> thunder God Vine. <laughs> I presume it only grows, maybe only grows in Thailand or around, you know, that sort of area of Asia, um, which is why we've got to go over there. And that's why they're researching it there. But they've discovered this one chemical in, in the Thunder God vine called uh, tryptonite. Mm. And they've been sticking it in some uh, rats and then looking at the uh, rat spunk through a microscope. And they've worked out that this chemical is basically disabling the sperms. So, you know, they're not going to be in any fit state to be fertilizing any eggs. And then from this, they're thinking, well, if we make pills out of this stuff, then men can take it and their sperm will become just as useless as the rats. And they can, uh, you know, go about sowing their useless oats. Yeah, as they say. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sowing their mild but- oats. <laughs> <laughs> that's the invention isn't it yeah that, that's I mean, it you've, you've described it really well yeah vivian is at pains less less anyone at home starts writing in because doctors are murdering innocent sperm she's very she's at pains to point out that they're not dead they're just asleep <laughs> and that's that's the idea just kind of um yeah put your sperm to sleep so that it, they just can't get there they just can't get there and if they got there they wouldn't know what to do because they're plum tuckered out and importantly uh if you stop taking the tablet or rather if they stop injecting the mice the sperm come back alive which is uh, uh that's the the two important things the two stages to work out mm. whether this would be great as a tablet is one is reversible, which it seems to be, and then the other is, well, we're going to try it in humans, but they haven't done that yet. So fingers crossed right. we find out. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, it needs to be reversible. That's the whole point of the tablet, isn't it? Because yep. if it's not reversible, you might as well just irradiate your testicles <laughs> yeah. or uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. any number of things you could possibly do to them that would render you completely uh, infertile. But then, well, I have to say, Mark, what set me on edge here, I know you didn't do as much science as me at school, no. but... What is absolutely drummed into you when you operate a microscope is that when you've got the sample on the slide there, you put the sample on, in this case, uh, some uh, lovely fresh rat spunk, you're supposed to put a glass cover slip over the top of it. Mm. Because otherwise, when you're looking through the microscope, there's every possibility that you just dip the lens... Uh, and then you've got rat spunk all over your lens. It's, it's, these scientists here, Mark, they're, they're not doing that. They're just they're just shooting from the hip with their microscope technique. It, it, it's, uh, Renegades. So I, I just wondered whether they're not actually real scientists, Mark. I mean, I've, I feel like if you wow. if you had you know if you had the proper training, you would know that that that's a, you know that's a necessary part of microscopy. So what are you alleging, Russ? Who are they? If they're not, if they're not real scientists, <laughs> what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that that this doctor has convinced a bevy of attractive women to <laughs> become part of his human trials to see if he fails to impregnate them? Is that what you're suggesting? Because I don't. I think that's really unfair. That's so rude. Just because they haven't put a little thing on top of the unbelievable, Russ. The places your mind goes. I'm just, I mean... Uh, You're just asking just questions. There, You're just asking yeah, questions. I'm just asking, I'm just asking, <laughs> just asking questions. questions. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, another little bit of product placement there. Mm. Uh, obviously, clearly, Olympus microscopes mm. are the premium rat spunk inspecting microscopes. I mean, you joke about that, but I, I've got a sneaky suspicion there's a lot of scientists out there looking at rat spunk pretty much every day. <laughs> I mean, rats are only so big, so like you have to look at something. Mean. <laughs> Rip mains. Why, why do you think, this is something else I should look up at some point, but I've never bothered. Why are all laboratory mice and rats white? Is it to differentiate them from ones that might have just accidentally just wandered into the lab? Well, I, I'm gonna, I, so, they don't, so they don't get mixed up in their, mixed up in their experiments? I'm going to pause something here, Russ. What, what if all rats are mice except the ones in the city are just dirty? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe there are specific, there are specific subbreed of rats that are docile or, you know, uh, more human-like. I don't know. That's a good question. No idea. Mm. But they always are, aren't they? Yeah. Well, they've got those lovely cute pink eyes that people adore. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Next time, next time we have an episode where a white rat or mouse turns up, it will trigger my brain and I'll remember to, uh, I'll remember to look into it. It is a good question, actually. It's a really um, good question. But Vivian Parry, Mark. Quite excitingly, mm-hmm. she's a uh, a new presenter mm. 
Always good to have a new presenter. Well, welcome, on. Vivian. I, I do remember her quite distinctly from this yes, program. Actually, correct. I think she's got she's got a very distinct voice. I she does. I'm not really sure what it is what it is about her voice, but it's to you delivery can hear it in your yeah, head once you've yeah, heard it. Cadence sort of as much as anything. Yeah, and I, I've got to say, I know last last time I said that I named all of the OBEs. Oh, I yeah. don't think I included her, did I? No, but no, I don't think you did. She, turns out that she's got a bloody oh, OBE as well. Well done, her. But uh, yeah, so she was born on the 4th of June, 1956, in Portsmouth, which means she, in this program, she's basically exactly the same age as us, pretty much. Brilliant. Prime of uh, life. <laughs> Everything ahead of her. Uh, she went to St. Swithin's School, Winchester, okay. which uh, unfortunately, Mark, is a very posh bo- oh dear. boarding school. Disappointing. So, boo, boo. And she studied zoology at Bedford College in London and then immunology and genetics at UCL. Cool. You know, proper, proper science. Got a bona fides up. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I mean, she probably was, you know, that was setting her teeth on edge seeing that cool yeah. microscope technique, I would have thought. I'm surprised she didn't just rest, rest the rat, rat spunk off of that uh, young lady and do it properly. But uh, her first job was as the national organiser of a charity called Birthright. Have you heard of Birthright? I I don't um, recall anything, no. No, to do with gynaecology and obstetrics. But I think from what I could find is it's basically, it's not an anti-abortion charity, but it's a charity that tries to help women so that they don't get abortions, if you see what I mean. I do, so, yeah. So they're not, it's not like swivel-eyed loons yeah. standing outside of abortion clinics or anything like that. It's just, if you have an unplanned pregnancy... Making sure you're aware of all the... Op- yeah, and we can help okay. you yeah. if, if you, you know, sort of thing. But she was okay. she was uh, in charge of that charity for a long time, from 1979 till 1994. Uh, and during that, uh, she became friends with um, Princess Diana, who was the patron of the charity. Yeah. They became uh, good buddies, which I think is probably why she ended up getting the OBE, to be honest, Mark. I can't, can't see what else she's done to it's get It's who you that know, OBE. isn't it? It's who you know. Exactly, yeah. See, exactly, yeah. Yeah, she presented tomorrow as well between 1994 and 1997, so this was probably one of one of her later uh, episodes. Oh, yeah, be, yeah. um, but she, she carried on doing reporting for the BBC, and now she's one of those sort of um, science gravy train types that we that we get, you know, where she's on she's on boards yeah, of yeah. different She has a portfolio of yeah, 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 directorships. And she hosts, yeah. hosts conferences yeah. and, and things like that. What, what I did notice about her website is that where she really comes alive is when she's talking about gardening, even though she doesn't have any work that involves gardening, but she has a whole section where she talks about gardening, and it's much more enthusiastically written. Mm. And um, and it includes this includes this quote: "She is hopeless with brassicas and a fool with beans. A fool with beans. <laughs> a fool with oh. beans. Hope always triumphs over experience, and every year she's astonished to be inundated with courgettes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's really yeah. sweet." And obviously, uh, I just imagined her putting lots of little condoms on each of the... Of uh, course. Of, the cool shit, of course. <laughs> because uh, all those free ones she probably blagged in the, uh, in the cabbages and condoms restaurants. Yeah. But yeah, so that's Vivian Parry. Uh, I'm sure we'll see probably a lot more of her because I, I seem to remember her being on it quite I do a lot. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the male pill, this is, this is one of those ones where, as I keep saying, where it's a medical segment. They show us some research... They tell us it's about to come about. Yeah. Then I look into it and I discover that they've just published the same research last year. Oh, really? Which is exactly, which is exactly what's happened here. The pro- I think the problem here with with the Thunder God vine yep. is that it has a number of it has it has a number of uses. It, it's been used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. However, all of the actual proper medical authorities say stay well away from it because it's actually really poisonous. Oh, okay. So, so that one thing that they What's it called? The tryptonide that they managed to extract from a hundred kilos of it. Yeah. <clears throat> That's okay. That's reasonably safe. But the problem is, is that everything else in the Thunder God vine is highly toxic. So it's a really difficult sort of thing to to extract. And so so there's sort of like a blanket thing where they go, just just don't bother with this stuff. This is it's too much of a hassle to, to deal with. And especially because in have swooped the University of Minnesota in the meantime, and they've invented an entirely different new thing, which is looks like it's actually going to be the male contraceptive pill. Okay. Because it's it's much it's completely safe. It's not toxic at all. It works by apparently Vitamin A is the thing that's required to make sperms. This pill just stops 
your body from using the vitamin A to make sperm. So you just don't have any sperm. So it just, rather than, as the Thunder God thing, it was relying on putting the sperm to sleep mm. and making them a bit useless. The, this one that Minnesota University has made, you just don't make any sperm. It's much more, it's much more effective and, and safer that way. They've been testing it recently. And the article I saw was from March the 22nd this year. And they said they're just about to undertake human trials of this. So uh, it's hot off the presses, really. So it looks like... It is very recent. Yeah. That's really interesting. It looks like possibly yeah. it, is around, it is around the corner, Gosh. you know, however long it takes takes these things to be tested. It, it does make work because at the beginning, they talk about male contraception and it's Shanna's, isn't she? She says, um, there have been approaches before, but they were either painful injections or they had unacceptable side effects. So you do wonder, because the idea of, of, of a tablet that prevents you from making sperm, like obviously you make everything else, but like the actual sperm, they just, they're not made. Like it seems like such a simple no. idea. You do wonder what the previous attempts were bearing in mind this is 25 years ago that she was talking about stuff mm. in the past i because like i was saying i what the hell are the unacceptable <laughs> side effects uh w- willie dropped off it has to be doesn't it <laughs> i mean there was I, I i didn't see it but i did, there was a program on tv last night about a guy whose penis fell off and they sewed it onto his arm to keep it going oh i've heard about yeah, him yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. there was that there was a quote from him where he said it it's all okay except when I hug my nan at Christmas yeah. and hit her in the eye. Yeah, and the other one was uh, <laughs> if you have to reach over to the uh, the back burner on your oven or something like that. <laughs> Bless him, he has a sense of oh, humour about it. There's got, got to be a film in that, isn't there? Yeah, he has, he's had a bit of a sad life, actually. There's a reason his penis oh, really? fell off. because he was a, Oh, like he had an abscess, but like he was a drug addict. So he just like, he popped it himself and the, it was oh. so infected that literally, apparently, his penis oh, fell off. Bloody which, hell. Which, you know, I mean, that is... That's something you don't expect to see, <laughs> I suppose. No, I'm no, trying, to think, no. trying, to th- trying to think of a phrase of describing what I'm thinking. It's like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. But I, the thing about it was like, you imagine there's a bit of a lead time, isn't there? Between mm, like... Where you, where, where you start to get a bit concerned. Yeah. Before, you know, like, it, it's not like, oh, I popped an abscess and then like... <laughs> you know, like there's, there's, there's got to be an in-between moment. Anyway, we're getting away from the point. Uh, well, I was going to say, that, that, that is a big 90s reference, though, isn't it? Uh, I mean, John Wayne Bobbitt. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was referenced constantly yeah. in the 90s, wasn't it? It really was, yeah. yeah. I wonder what he's up to these days. Well, he went into porn, didn't he, for a while? Once it was reattached? Oh. I don't know. I'm sure it'll be a Netflix documentary if it isn't already. Because <laughs> the thing is, Maybe he'll turn up on Tomorrow's World at some point, because, I mean... Ooh. We can, but I hope. <laughs> yeah. It feels like the pill, specifically the male pill, seems like an idea that has always been just a little bit away. So it's really interesting mm. that you've come across research that basically just replicates what we've just seen. But yeah, no, it makes perfect sense because the idea is it has to be temporary, obviously a bit like the pill. I, I suppose I was just really fascinated. I was just thinking like, what were the unacceptable side effects? I just don't want to think about it. Or the painful injections, <laughs> like, because like we've all been jabbed at least three times in the last year. If, you know, two or three times in the last year, I imagine most people listening. A- and it's not that much different to any other jabs we've had. What made the previous attempt at the male contraceptive injection painful uh, you know it's like where or what was it i don't know i'm, just, I'm absolutely <laughs> right fascinated it has to be doesn't it or the or, you know the shaft there's a good which is a, 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 a good a damn good right <laughs> <laughs> Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, no, and that was it. No, it's it's uh, really interesting. I, I wonder what will come of it. No pun intended. Should we, should we, should we... And what's quite interesting here, I, I I think one of the highlights of the episode just coming up here that we've, oh, we've yeah. separated off here. Haven't we? we have, it's, deliberately. It's worth discussion in itself. We've got a lovely little um, Vox Pop section mm. where, where we, we find out what the residents of Shepherd's Bush think about this yeah, idea the, of a male Yeah, the, the Tomorrow's World uh, went far and wide to get as many opinions of the entire British population as possible <laughs> by, what, turning left when they <laughs> went out the front door of BBC <laughs> TV Centre? It is literally... I would say the closest stretch of pavement to BBC TV Centre that they <laughs> that you could find members of the public on. And the question is, what do the British people think? So, will women trust men to take the pill? Will men even want it? We thought we would take the nation's pulse on this one. Yeah, why not? It's about time men ta- started taking you know, serious responsibility for contraception. Well, that's a good idea. No, I don't think so. For those people who would take it, they should consider what the side effects are. Performance, I don't know about that there, you know? They're not going to get pregnant if they forget to take it, are they? They're not going to carry the responsibility, they're not going to bear a child, bring it up. They can do a runner any time they want to. 
And most men are irresponsible. Of course you're not, dear, but most men are. <laughs> we don't trust the women to take it either. <laughs> I mean, they say, you know, yeah, yeah, don't worry, you know. No problems, with ta I'm taking it regular. Next thing, what happens? I wouldn't trust the men today, not from here to there, to be quite honest. I wouldn't, because I wouldn't need one. <laughs> I think I'll keep out of that one. Talk about a cast of characters. Unbelievable. Mark. Maybe Shepherd's Bush Market was, you know, had that many random people in it every day. I guess probably it did. But probably. It, but I, I feel like I, I feel like you've got a, a real range of real cross section of the British public there. Well, you, you had a real cross section of the Shepherd's Bush public. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, do you know, I, I, in all our talk earlier about um, Doctor Archie and Professor Igor and their amazing, astonishing items of clothing, I had completely forgotten about about one of the people we saw <laughs> and his hat. And, and I, I'm, I'm actually no longer convinced that. Either Archie or Igor win most notable cl clothing because that that hat is amazing. <laughs> but l let's go through it in order because, like, a bit like you, I, I I have no real time for Vox Pops. I I think it's no. it's it's fluff, it's filler. Every now and then you'll see someone who will say something funny, and, and which is always great. But ultimately. Uh, ultimately, it, it, it's it's just filler. Like uh, you know, uh, when I especially when I tune into the news, I really do want to know what experts think or people involved think. Mm. I, I don't really want to know what other people who are uninvolved and not experts think. It's as simple as that. And they're usually not thinking. They're usually no. saying the first. No, of course thing they are. That... I mean, and nor should they. They're not experts. You know, they're, no. they're, they're you know, microphone plunged in front of their face, and they're asked to say something. Obviously, the, the polite thing to do is not answer. Like you, you say, whatever comes off the top of your head, fine. That to me is not really news. Nonetheless, this is incredible. This this really is like this is like a little archive of this moment in time. Yeah. And this, as you say, Shepherd's Bush Market apparently is populated by. A soap opera's worth of incredible people. <laughs> and, and it starts off with the first guy. He's like a pretty straight-laced, middle-class person. He says, yeah, why not? It's about time that men started taking serious responsibility for contraception. And he says that stood in front of his son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah brilliant yeah. and, and his, his wife she his comes wife later yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. she, she goes in a real rant about how like me, me, they're never there they won't take responsibility yeah. they're just <laughs> basically they're disgraceful you can't trust them yeah. except except you dear <laughs> yeah Talk, talking to her husband uh, you know about yeah. the same gender as her husband in front of her son <laughs> And she, she was really venting. Really she? venting, yeah. yeah. She's yeah. she's thought about this hard. There's the gentleman who looks like a, a Rastafarian. He says um, uh, he's he's worried about side effects, which I think is really important. But he does rather give the game away by immediately admitting that he's mostly worried about quote unquote performance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Then Peter K turns yeah, up as yeah. a, but he look he looks like he doesn't look, he doesn't like Peter K Peter K he looks like when Peter K plays a character yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And something like he's got those big glasses yeah. but yeah I, I think he's running some sort of uh, shoe shop or something like that he he doesn't you can't trust women he, Russ no I can't trust can't them, trust no. women Russ <laughs> I mean you ask if and they say yeah they're taking the pill regularly and then look what happens boom then you got the old woman who you can't trust men men cannot be trusted. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd probably feel a bit awkward asking a lady that old about contraception yes. from the point of view of the cameraman or whoever it is who did the asking. But yeah, I guess it's worth it for her for her contribution. She's brilliant, <laughs> isn't she? And then you know we finish off with with the old man with with what I can only describe is the hat because I, I can't I literally can't describe. It. I don't know what it is. He's he's dressed perfectly normal. Perfectly otherwise. normal. He's just wearing perfectly just wearing normal. like normal like, yeah. beige old man clothes. But then that hat. What the hell like is he a, wearing? Is it, like a sm is it a Smurf hat? Kind of. Is it woolen? I don't know. It's kind of like a kind of a cream ivory color. I don't, it's just the. I promise you. Again, there will there will be pictures that you will be able to see. And maybe maybe if you write in, you can describe to us exactly what you think that hat is. Because seeing it, I don't think it explains it at all. He's really sweet though. Like he basically says, like he wouldn't take the pill because he doesn't need one. It's heavily implied he's getting no action. Despite that hat. Despite despite the hat. Yeah, absolutely. He could just roll that hat on. 
as a condom, couldn't he? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's, maybe that's why <laughs> that's he's saying he doesn't it. need it because, hey, look what I, look what I got. Yeah, I'm always wearing my prophylactic on my head. I don't know. It's, it, it, it actually, in an episode full of astonishing things, it might be the most astonishing. Uh, but I was, I, as, as I say, as, as someone who used to work around there, mm. I was delighted to see that Fisherman's Hut, that, that's why I recognised immediately where it was. Yeah. It was Fisherman's Hut. Very decent chippy. So that means it's, uh, it's, it must be a very long running uh, chippy. Well, it, go, it looks old in this video. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would say it looks a bit newer these days. Um, always nice to go down there, get a tr- get a tray of chips with a little sprinkling of Donna meat on the top. Ooh, yeah, delish. Uh, yeah, How much yeah, did that yeah, set yeah, you back? Yeah. Oh, not very much. About three quid, oh, four quid, something like that. It's a dream. Yeah. Go back to the office absolutely stinking. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> What a, what a considerate uh, person you are. Now, on May the 3rd, New York City will play host to a battle between the titans of chess, and only one of them is human. Last year, world chess champion Garry Kasparov saw off a challenge from the most powerful chess computer in the world. But the computer has bounced back, now it's cleverer than ever and hungry for revenge. With a few days to go until the two contenders square up to one another, let's take a look at their form. When he arrives here in Manhattan next week, Garry Kasparov will carry with him the hopes of humanity. So far, the world's best chess player has managed to stay ahead of his computerised opponent. But the gap is narrowing quickly, and they're about to go head to chip once again. And this is the venue for the big match. So let's take a look at the contenders. Garry Kasparov, world champion for 12 years, the people's choice. And in the technology corner, the number cruncher itself, Deeper Blue. Measuring in at 5 foot 10 and 12 stone, it's a good job Kasparov's not trying to wrestle the 6 foot 5, one and a half ton supercomputer. It was seven years ago when IBM's top brain started to plot the end of human domination of the chessboard. The result, the computer Deep Blue. But early reports of the machine's capabilities failed to impress Kasparov. If I am or in another chess player, if, if we are capable of using our advantages, which is anticipation, intuition, uh, uh, imagination, the machine will be always in trouble. The 1990s, Mark, a real heyday for the, uh, for the words deep blue, weren't they? <laughs> Because you've got this, you've got these, this this deep blue computer, yep. and then you've got the Samuel L. Jackson film, Deep, deep Blue Sea, yep. and then you've got the smash hit record, mm. Breakfast at Tiffany's by Deep Blue something. Very true, Russ. That's three. I wonder why not. That's three. That's three. No, well, that's you need. I mean, that's journalistic rule, that's isn't it? it? Yeah. I mean, if there's three, yeah. it's three, it's three. It's tre- I mean, you might as well just call it Deep Blue Gate. Just, that's it now. <laughs> Time of the boat, we're done. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder... Probably coincidence or... Uh, <laughs> Probably a coincidence, says Russell. Yes. <laughs> it might be. It may not be, though, Russ. It was, it was a good observation, there. yeah. Chess. Mm. What's your... Uh, I, I find it very hard to muster up any excitement about the game of chess. I, I, I don't mind a board game. I know how to play chess. Mm. But just something... I, I think it's to do with the way that the whole thing evolves planning ahead and mm. anticipating other people's moves. It just leaves me cold. I don't I don't That's what I like about it. Do you do you enjoy you do enjoy a game of test year? I've not played it for years. I, I used to play it at school and, and and afterwards. And it's one of those things where I every now and then it pops into my head as <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> All right, Ross. You know we were friends at school. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know you played chess. <laughs> and uh, every now and then it pops back into my head, oh, I'd love to take up chess again. And I and I don't. I always forget. And it's because I always felt like... See, I don't like board games. Oh, not even Triv? Oh, yeah, that's that's the exception. Because that, that's 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 a true test of, I don't know, general knowledge, maybe? No, I, obviously, you know, I love Triv. But I don't like board games in... Like, I don't like a Monopoly or anything like that. And that's because when playing board games, I am incredibly competitive. And I really, really dislike... The feeling of wanting to win what is completely nonsense. I, I dislike it so much, I don't play games. I've not played a board game for a very long time. My my wife plays board games with some friends of hers. But they, they meet up and they it's great. She loves it. They have a great time and they, they love playing it. And actually, in general, loads of people love playing board games. I really, really, I will happily leave the room and sit on my own and watch TV or read a book or whatever, <laughs> or just look at Twitter and, and completely avoid being part of it. Because if I do... I will not enjoy the process and I will try and ruin it for everyone else to win. <laughs> and uh, I think I think it's very mature to go like, no, nope, not for me. But chess I did like because the thing is, I got quite good at it when I was younger. And it was because I used to enjoy sitting there and thinking 
about the possible future moves. That felt really interesting. You could feel like a part of your brain being exercised and um, you can't think about anything else as well. That was the other thing about chess. Like you're constantly holding in your head. You're holding in the head all these... I mean, you've just seen Doctor Strange and the madness of the multiverse or whatever. It's like that you're having to keep all these possible future uh, moves in your head and, and trying to keep track of them. And I think that's quite interesting. I think it's kind of fun. But I, equally, I can understand why you wouldn't and other people wouldn't because obviously you don't like no. you don't like planning ahead at all i despise planning ahead yeah. and even when I, I mean i when other people are trying to plan things mm. it annoys me it genuinely annoys me so i i have to i have to try and not engage with people who are planning things which is most because... people most of the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think just don't bother just it doesn't matter you don't need to you just <laughs> just bowl into it and, and you'll be able to sort it out as, as you're going the idea of thinking about possibilities multiple moves ahead sounds like absolute hell to me I'm entirely reactionary that's why Triv's that's why Triv's the king well Triv, Triv just, is the best is the best just throw a question at me yeah. and I'll respond there's no real strategy in Triv you just, just answer questions I mean basically you, know, no, you, you no. do wear the ball game and just, just chuck questions at each other I mean that, that's why my favourite TV quiz show was 15 to 1 because mm, mm. just question just after question, question after question after question, question. question. and and as as an audience member you could play it one or two ways you could just try and answer every single question or you could pretend to be a number and see how you would do in their mm. shoes brilliant that was that was such a good quiz and there was no messing around you know william g stewart did not sit there and interview everyone and hear about the backstory because who gives a fuck we're here to no. answer questions move on yeah. bash 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 bosh bosh brilliant love it it was perfect Everything subsequently, apparently, you've got to fill time by asking people about who they are. Don't care. They don't care. No. They don't want to tell you. They want to win. They want to play the quiz. They're not. Yeah. They know that. They know their life story. They don't need to. They don't need to be reminded of it. <laughs> they, they want to win the quiz. Let's go. It doesn't happen anymore. Anyway, that's a by the by. No, I mean, but chess is a completely different thing, and I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, nothing is true. But but it was big this time, wasn't it? It was a big. It was a big event this time because like it wasn't just deep Huge. blue. Because like I also remember. When Gary Kasparov played Nigel Short, and Nigel Short was yes, still the yeah. first British person ever to get to the final. Of, yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And that was a huge deal. And I, I remember every game being broadcast live on um, Channel, Channel 4. 4. Yeah, it was Channel 4, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, and yeah, I mean, it was yeah. a blowout, but I, I tuned in. Lots of people tuned in. And it was on TV. And it was a huge deal for the few weeks it was on. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal. But but specifically Deep Blue, this idea of man versus machine was, was huge. This, this idea of like, you know, you can teach a computer moves, right? You can teach a computer how to win a game. But you don't win a chess game by doing moves. You win a chess game by strategizing and pre-planning and working out what your opponent is going to do plotting tricking you need to be fleet a fleet of you need to be imaginative you know it was all these kind of this mm. idea of this like there's a difference between hard power and soft power there's a difference between knowing something and feeling something there's a, you know blah 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 etc etc and this is what this was battle was about it's like obviously deep blue or any other computer that played chess can do something that you can't which is process however many moves in a second because that's all it does it, it it can't make you tea but it can do this one thing incredibly well but what does that mean you know what does that mean versus a grandmaster who 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 can play well, chess that... well but also can go to burton's and buy a shirt but that's the thing that's the thing well they always they went up with all these machines they always say oh this machine can mm. do so many moves a second or whatever or can process so many moves a second yeah. whereas a human can only do three or two like how it says yeah or two i don't think that's true i think it's just that a computer because we we we've designed the computer and we can measure it we know exactly how many calculations it can do yeah that doesn't mean you're it's not doing comparing it. like, no, with no, like. No, no, no. whereas yeah. a human brain is doing could be doing billions and trillions of calculations that we are unable to measure mm. we're, we're only conscious of thinking of one thing at any one time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the conscious brain is only thinking of one move yeah. but there's absolutely no guarantee that there's not the subconscious brain absolutely flipping through millions of combinations yeah. no, very itself true. Yeah. so I, that's that's all i always think about when and it's probably like a good explanation as to why humans are a lot cleverer than than they seem to <laughs> then we give ourselves credit for it. yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah that was the last time chess was big isn't it the night so the, the, as you say this and the nigel short thing 
both big chess stories. There's not there's not been much, well, uh, not been much in the way of chess stories the, the, these the days. The new so. guy, the Norwegian Wunderkin, uh, Magnus something. Mag- Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen. He he's been a big story over the last few years. Just in terms of like by all accounts he might be the best chess player of all time. He holds all the titles. He just won't refuse to he refuses to to let them go. But also, I mean, for me the big story about him was that about a year and a half ago during lockdown, he also plays the official Premier League fantasy football game and he was the world's number one for like two weeks and he, really? and he immediately changed his twitter bio to world's number one fpl all he wants to do <laughs> is win fpl that's that you know for a while he was obsessed with it you know and he and he didn't win that he didn't win that season and he was you know that oh. you know, he was he was angry <laughs> yeah like you know he he wants to win fpl he's got all these grandmaster titles but fpl is the one for him I wonder what the cause there must be. I guess there must be some sort of crossover then in the strategies. Oh yeah, oh, it can't be a co- it can't be a coincidence that he's he's a no, not not at all. And... I, I mean, I I I play it and I I follow a few people on Twitter just to kind of get hints and tips. And like they go way into the weeds of like they. I'm not going to get too de- details, otherwise you'll cut this out. <laughs> but but like, <laughs> but like they are plotting. You know, when when a game was postponed because of COVID, they were trying to plot weeks ahead when that rescheduled game would go in because then you would know that a team would have two games in one week and so they were plotting out transfer moves for a player 10 weeks time and then working backwards to see when they should oh. and i was thinking like okay that's yeah that's that's, that's chess, that's chess that's ab- yeah, and that was yeah, the thing yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, and, and like they would you, you'd read even like a like a couple of t- tweets in a twitter thread and you're like i have completely lost track of what i recognize all these words and I'm playing this game and I have no idea. And like, there's one guy who has this incredible kind of um, uh, spreadsheet and he tracks all these things. Like, that is what they're doing with chess. But they're, you know, it's a real world thing. It's out of their control. Yeah, I, I absolutely think you, I can see why a Magnus Carlsen is brilliant at Fantasy Premier League. Equally, other people who are really good at Fantasy Premier League are people who used to be footballers who like just kind of have a gut feeling, you know, yeah. which you can't really do with yeah. chess. You can't really get like, oh, I, I might move that here, see what happens. I just have a good feeling. But <laughs> as I say that that might connect into my thing the gut feeling yeah. is calculation not necessarily no, be a gut no, feeling. That, that, yeah. that's the subconscious yeah, yeah. calculation yeah, yeah. coming in yeah. it's just that they they're just less aware of their yeah. of what's going on but yeah i guess i guess we haven't do we need to explain what's going on here i don't okay, i guess I we've not actually explained basically it's so there's a giant supercomputer called deep blue and it's gary kasparov is the at the time the greatest chess player the world has ever seen Obviously, he's now been superseded by this Magnus Carlsen fella, mm-hmm. but but at the time, um, there was no one better than him. And IBM built this supercomputer with the express purpose of trying to beat him, because certainly back then, the idea was that if you if you could build a computer that was able to outthink a human at chess, then that was pretty much the top test of a computer's intelligence. Obviously, since then, and in a previous episode, we discovered that actually. The top intelligence for a computer is the one that can play the game Go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the time, that possibly because because of racism, Euro- and Eurocentrism. A, uh, yeah, yeah, Eurocentrism. Yeah. That's the better phrase. Yeah. But yeah, so they built this deep blue supercomputer, and it challenged old Gary back in uh, 1996 so last for the year. first round. Yeah. And Gary, well, gave it a damn good thrashing. So IBM went back to the drawing board, upgraded the software and all that, and have come back for a rematch. And that's what that's why uh, it's referred to as Deeper Blue, because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like the um, Die Hard films. Mm-hmm. So they've, they've uh, had a bit on there. And at the moment, as, as this episode co- goes out, the viewers don't know whether Deeper Blue beat Gary or not, because it's yet to happen. Mm. But we all know, don't we, Mark? Mm-hmm. The Deeper Blue won. He did win. It that, beat, I remember. It yeah, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. Yeah. And that's probably that's, that is probably why it is remembered. Yeah. Because I imagine there's probably loads of computers have taken on chess players. It's just that this one was because it was the first one to actually beat beat the master, the grandmaster, that, 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 the world that, champion, yeah. whatever you want to call them, the best of all time. Blah blah. Certainly the best around at the moment. And then beat him. And I, I, I vaguely remember like it. It wasn't like he it narrowly squeaked. It was like no. It was a convincingly good player. Yeah, I can tell actually. I Ooh, can tell. Dude, Where's the result? Dude. The result here. So it won, Deep Blue won three and a half to Gary's two and a half. Oh, okay. It was a bit closer, yeah. So I guess the halves the draw are matches. a draw. Yeah. A draw, yeah, yeah. Although there is a little bit of... It, well, there's some interesting things because... So there's a few different so things it, that it just on to me, the match. We, we, both convinced, we both said, yeah, yeah, absolutely draw matches. Like, we have no idea. We just, we well, just why sound... Why should so, there be a half? No, no, it was just like, we just sound so convincing, though, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's what I wanted. It's like, yeah, no, we we absolutely both completely convinced ourselves that we knew the answer. No, it has to be there. Don't don't, be. don't shine daylight. Sorry, I'm magic. so sorry. I'm sorry. That's, just, the, that's it, the basis of this I, entire shut, bloody podcast. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there was a few interesting things happened in this match. The first one I, I, I thought was was that in in the first game of the match on the forty fourth <clears> move, <throat> Deeper Blue's programming got stuck. Basically, a bit like happens to us sometimes. It couldn't think of anything other than this loop of moves. But luckily, they'd considered this in the software, so they they'd given it like a get out clause, where if it found itself stuck in a loop where it couldn't stop thinking about this thing, mm-hmm. it would just break out of the loop by just playing anything, like just a random legal move. Mm-hmm. So that's what it ended up doing. But Kasparov obviously wasn't expecting that because he was expecting to know what it was going to do. Yeah. And so it's it saw Deeper Blue play this sudden move that which he was not expecting at all, and it shook him. He thought, oh, oh, god. Is this supercomputer know something that I don't? Yeah. And people claim that that's kind of shook. Yeah, it shook him. At the yeah, beginning I imagine, yeah. Because he thought, oh, this supercomputer knows something like that. He claims that he didn't, but, you know, he did lose. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on his side, he noticed that during the second game, the machine started playing differently than he than it was playing in the first game. And he reckoned that between between the first and second game, IBM had intervened in some way. and, and uh, uh, They were changing at the fly. Sh- sh- shenanigans yeah. going on. And IBM obviously completely denied this. Uh, and he said, well, okay, let's do a rematch. And IBM said, oh, no, we've already dismantled it. You can't. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. And he said, okay, well, release the computer, release the logs. Yeah. So we can have a look through them. And they said, no, no, we'll do that. Oh, well, that is And then they suspicious. waited a bit. And then they released the logs yeah. later on. And? With plenty of time. Oh, okay. You know. Yeah. They, yeah, could, yeah. they didn't release them immediately. Yeah, 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 So there's a possibility they could have. Oh, that does sound suspicious, isn't it? So th- I imagine that's what's still playing in the back of Kasparov's mind, yeah. is that is that he was actually... He was nobbled. ...stitched up a bit. <laughs> but yeah, those, uh, I mean... Deep Blue got split into two because it was two. It was basically two racks, two racks of computer chips. They split the two bits up, and one bit's in one museum, the other bit's in another museum. But yeah, Kasparov says he thought it was a load of old rubbish. Now he does. He reckons that Deeper Blue was about as intelligent as an alarm clock. That's what he says. <laughs> However, he gives big praise to the the Go computer. That you know the one yeah, that we yeah, covered yeah, before, yeah, Al- yeah. Alpha Zero. Yep. He says Alpha Zero is absolutely great bunch of lads. <laughs> Because uh, it seems to think like him, very creative. Oh. <laughs> so he's, uh, yeah, yeah, he's all, all over that. Yeah. But uh, Gary Kasparov, very interesting character, isn't he? Yeah. Like, in himself, it's like, there's a strange, is it just because he's obviously super intelligent that he's become a high achiever? Or is there something in the nature of being an international chess player, the circles you move in and things like that? that because obviously mm. he's now become like a quite an important not quite a politician, well, political, but a political figure, yeah, political yeah. figure, yeah, and campaigner, yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. Is there a connection yeah. there? I mean, oh, I mean, well, look, if he if he wasn't the grandmaster of chess, former grandmaster of chess, I don't suppose we'd have heard from him. Good question. I I, I assume so. I assume it's like it, 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 you know he's listened to you because people know who he is. Because and to be fair to him, like he really was incredible. And he did achieve a lot because of his mind, which probably it must it must be useful in being able to have a proven ability to think that far ahead yeah must be a useful talent in I'm, political I'm, yeah I, you know. I i assume so i mean I, I don't suppose it's kind of directly applicable like I mean, bobby fisher was great at chess but he wasn't great at life so you know <laughs> you maybe, maybe maybe he was too good you know maybe he was too focused i don't know it's a good question I, I suppose is your question because he's good at chess is he good at kind of analyzing politics i would say no i'd say he's not wrong presently is he about Putin and Russia, no, and he hasn't been wrong no. for quite a while. Like he, he really was. Felt like him and Bill Browder were about the only two people really pushing hard about six, seven years ago, when the rest of us were. Kind yeah. Of... Now, where, where did I read it? Oh, here we go. He, yeah, he published a book called in 2015. He published mm. a book called Winter Is Coming: Why Vladimir Putin and the Enemies of the Free World Must Be Stopped. He said Putin was like Hitler, and the West needs to oppose Putin sooner rather than appeasing him. And postponing the eventual confrontation, which uh, <laughs> I guess is happening now, is it? A few more Gary Kasparov facts that you may or may not be aware of. He was born on the 13th of April, 1963, in Baku, Azerbaijan, mm-hmm. as they always say in Eurovision. Azerbaijan. They always say Azerbaijan rather than Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. I've always noticed. Yep. But his surname is not Kasparov. Do you know what his surname is, Mark? Kasparovich. Putin. What is it? Weinstein. Weinstein. Wow. Yes. 
there was a lot of anti-Semitism where he lived around this time. Mm. Probably still is. Mm. Uh, so he decided to change it. But I mean, what a he's lucked out there, isn't he? he, he, he even without the anti-Semitism, well, I mean, it's about, probably a great f- idea to change it from. <laughs> that, that is impressive forethought to kind of project yeah. into the future. And realize you don't want Weinstein. So I thought it was quite That's interesting. That's really interesting. Also, he's named after a U.S. president. Did you know that? Gary. Mm-hmm. There's no obviously there is no U.S. president Gary. No. But if you, I presume it's because of the difference way you pronounce G's in, in Russia. JFK? No, no. Oh, G? No. Oh, okay. It's named after Harry S. Truman. Oh. So I presume his name's Harry. Oh, or Harry, Harry. I got you. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. His dad admired Harry S. Truman's vehement anti-Soviet uh, communism sort of stance. Yeah. So he decided to name his son after him. Yeah. I guess maybe that explains why he's always been a bit anti- uh, Yeah. Yeah. Anti-authority. I suppose when I think about um, it, I've never really questioned why there was a Russian called Gary. Called Gary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's he, obvious he now. Said, <laughs> he said it's like a unbelievably rare name all growing up, and it's only when Harry Potter came out that suddenly there's, pe- there's now lots of Russia Garys. Were, are they? Were, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm curious. But yeah, he was. He Do you think there's many uh, Garmiones out there. <laughs> 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 this is my beautiful daughter Garmione. Well, I never read Harry Potter, but Hermione would be one of those words that if I never heard it said out loud, I would read it as Hermione, Yeah, I think. Yeah. In the same way that I always used to read Persephone as Persephone. Perse- that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Hyperbole as Hyperbole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a classic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We've, all, we've yeah. all done that, I think. Actually, the other one I always think is for a long time, like you, you, I, you'd read Segway and think it was Sieg. And like you think, yes. oh, th- yeah, that's a classic Sieg from one thing to another. Yeah, it's, it's only when somebody says like, no, no, it's Segway. Because like I thought Sieg was a perfect, and I've heard people use it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, because yeah, um, I always thought I always thought a good good name for like a cover band of that eighty segue segue Sputnik. Very good. Sputnik. Yeah, yeah, very good. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah, Kasparov still holds the record for the amount of months that he was world number one. Mm-hmm. But I don't know whether this uh, Magnus Carlsen... How old's Magnus Carlsen? Is he still young? 30-something, early 30s? Might have surpassed that at some point. Yeah. The Nigel Short thing also I thought was interesting. Did you know that... So when, when they set up this match, the FIDE, which is the, the chess... Body organiser. <laughs> chess baron. Yeah. Big chess. It's one, of the, it's, it's one of those ones that the acronym is French. Uh, you can always tell because there's always been an F, don't Yeah, they? Federation. Yeah, they came to some sort of disagreement. So Kasparov and Nigel Short just set up their own chess federation. So that match that they played mm. was played Breakaway. under their own... Fed- uh, no, Bre- yeah, they, they just set up the professional chess so association. Like the BDO and the PDA. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like darts or boxing. Yeah. They just set up their own thing. Apparently it caused absolute... Pandemonium? Nightmares. Yeah, yeah pandemonium and yeah. You know, an upset in the world of chess. Uh, but ironically, Nigel Short is now the vice president of the uh, FIB. <gasps> Turncoat. Wow, look yeah. at that. Oh, they came. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. But yeah, that, that, but Kasparov now, obviously, he's done all of these amazing political various things. Like that. Going up against Putin, mm. he'd, even he'd, like, he tried to run for president at one point. Uh, strange logistical problems got in his way, so that prevented him from actually running, Please. which I'm sure were all above board. To be fair, probably um, probably best for his health. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He eventually legged it from Russia uh, in 2013. You know, he's now a Croatian uh, national. He lives in Split. He's chairman of the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, he has his own organisation, which is called the Renew Democracy Initiative. Uh, so I reckon, I don't know, I've got a feeling he might, he might end up being like head of the UN or something. You know what I mean? Like, mm. That's the sort of thing he might, he might. That's, that's another thing I was thinking about. The UN, yeah, right? Yeah. Who's the current head of the UN? You know, I can't remember his name. And, uh, exactly. I, yeah, and the thing is, like, I know it because he was on, exactly. he was in Kiev and Kiev and M- Moscow last week. I cannot remember his name. And I, the second you mentioned him, I thought, I, I don't remember his name. Exactly. What is that weird? Yeah. So what's happening to the, what's happened to the UN press department? Because you could have asked anybody yeah. in the 1990s who's head of the UN, yeah. and they would have said Boutros Boutros Ghali, yeah. and then they would have said Kofi Annan, Kofi Annan. Yeah. and then got to 2000s, they would have said Ban Ki Moon. Right? Yeah. 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 And then what? Who? No idea. Good question. What's happened? I don't... Is it just because they all had funny names and are easy to remember? Well, and whoever the is the current guy called like I don't know James Smith oh, or something. It's... Latin American, isn't it? Garcia oh, is it? or something like that. Let's have a look. Yeah. It's very strange. It's very strange that, that this has suddenly slipped. Is it because the UN's less important these days? Or... I mean, that feels like that's probably correct, doesn't it? Oh, Antonio Guterres. 
Antonio Guterres. Guterres, yeah. Or Guterres. Guterres. Antonio Guterres, Guterres, yeah. Yeah, I recognise it. You know, and if somebody put down that name, I don't know. Yeah, maybe need a bit of context. No, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, Butrus Butrus Gali was a punchline on The Far Show. Yeah, The Far Show. Yeah. But, but I Kofi Annan was real. Of Far Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, as did yeah. I. I mean, that was why, like, that's why it was funny, because like, you knew who it was. But actually, when you think about yeah. it, it's a funny combination of words in, in the English language. But Kofi Annan was was real you know yeah he wasn't a punchline yeah that's a really good question and banky moon i don't know i don't know just one last thing about kasparov yeah. which is a little bit of a weird curveball at the end there is that he subscribes to a from what i can determine is a particularly russian conspiracy theory Ooh. it's uh to do it's called new chronology and it's the idea is is that all of what we think of as ancient history, mm-hmm. so the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, mm-hmm. all of these the Mesopotamians, everything like that, the way they're laid out to us is completely incorrect. And in fact, it was all one big civilization, and it happened much more recently in history. So they, so they think that it happened between about 1000 and the middle, like it happened in the Middle Ages rather than a couple of thousand years ago. Really? So they, they, they dispute things like carbon dating and, oh, wow. and things like this. So, because, because what they've done is that there's this Russian mathematician. He looks at all of the historical events in, in these civilizations and applied a mathematical formula to them and worked out that they all operate in the same pattern. Mm-hmm. And he said that's because actually they're all one civilization and all of these stor- historical stories are actually all the same stories, just repeated but with different names involved. So it sounds like different civilizations. Yeah, and actually, we should all be thinking faces. Of, yes. But in order Which, for that to work, and, you have to, it sounds like there's a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> you have to, yeah, yeah, you have to ignore carbon dating and things like yeah. that. But Kasparov goes, a lot he, he's, he's well on board with this and i wonder whether this is like to do with thinking mathematically like agreeing with this formula mm. and things and also I, I think this that that's the wrong conclusion you should get from the fact that all of these civilizations all did the same thing i think the conclusion you should get from that is that humans are very predictable and end up doing yeah. the same making the same mistakes yeah. over and over again and that, that's why these same things always happen but it's quite an interesting weird little quirk of his and probably might disqualify him from being head of the UN if he thinks, you know, Cleopatra and William the Conqueror were the same person. Or whatever. <laughs> yep. And she only died like 40 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one last thing. Mark. Oh, yeah. That's the one last one thing last I wanted thing. to ask you about, about chess. Do you call it a castle or do you call it a rook? You know I call it a rook, Russ. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> Unbelievable. Right. I'm outraged. <laughs> Get the audit book out. <laughs> Tell me, Russ, that, that sound and the wind, is that the sound of, of calculating machines crunching numbers? Yes, indeed, Mark. And I've broken out the old rusty reckoner. Oh, my gosh. Brilliant. Well, in that case, it is time for the audit. So let's start at the beginning. We're going to look at the year, 1997, which is a year you and I remember fondly, or, well, we remember, which is not true of all the episodes we do. And I'm sure it's a, a year uh, everyone else listening remembers. I can't imagine there's many people born in 1998 listening to this. Cinema box office. It's one of those ones where you think, has 20, 25 years passed or not? At number 10, The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, number nine. Metro, probably Eddie Murphy's last ever action film, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I don't know about that, but I remember it as an action. Yeah, Eddie Murphy action film. Yeah, gosh, took it took a bit of thinking to pull that one up. Yeah, uh, number eight, Space Jam. Brilliant. Whatever happened to that, eh? Uh, well, the website's still going, isn't it? No, they Famous updated thing. it for the new film. Oh, really? Yeah, they really did. Yeah, I know. It's disgusting. It's nothing nothing, nothing sacred. sacred. Number seven is a film called Eddie. It stars Whoopi Goldberg, Frank Langella, and Dennis Farina. Wow, okay. Vaguely rings a bell? No more than that. Uh, number six. The Saint, mm-hmm. which obviously I've, I've never watched out of loyalty to my hero, Roger Moore. No, you so. haven't. No. It's not great, Russ. So uh, 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 you that. know, it's not good. Number five. William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet. Yep, good. Uh, number four. Donnie Brasco. Yeah, okay. Uh, number three. Return of the Jedi. Brilliant. Um, number two, Scream. Oh. And number one, just in time for the election of Tony Blair, Liar, Liar. Oh my gosh. That says more about films now than it does films then, doesn't it? <laughs> what the half of them are. <laughs> Still, like, we, everything the, at the box office yeah. now is just... It's Same. Just yeah, like they're connected. <laughs> like we've even we've literally had a Scream reboot in the last yeah. month. <laughs> 
Brilliant. I feel uh, I feel invigorated and alive to live in these times. Pop music. Number 10, Hypnotise by the Notorious B.I.G. Mm-hmm. Uh, number 9, Don't Leave Me by Blackstreet. Okay. Uh, number 8, Old Before I Die uh, by Robbie Williams. Uh, number 7, Drop Dead Gorgeous by Republica. Uh, number 6, You Might Need Somebody by Shola Amma. Mm. Is that, is that, you might, you might need somebody. somebody. Yep. You might need, is that yep, that? that's the one. I quite like that song. I, so. I didn't know who that was by. Number five, Bellissima by DJ Quicksilver. Mm-hmm. Number four, Love Fall by The Cardigans. Oh, I like that song. That's from Romeo and Juliet. That's obviously, that's yeah. Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yep. She's banned from um, Nab- Papua New Guinea, isn't she, for saying it was a shithole? I don't remember that. Yeah, what's well, her name? Claire. Yeah, Claire. I don't. Know. Claire from the Cardigans. Claire Dickin. No, 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 no. Claire from Romeo and Juliet. Oh, Julia. is she? Claire Danes. Claire Danes. Oh, he's, he's singing. Claire Danes is banned from. I didn't know that. Hang on. Who's the lead singer of Cardigans? Oh, Nina. Nina's the lead singer of the Cardigans. Hang on. Claire Danes is banned. Let me just check. Hang on. Maybe it's not Papua New Guinea. Maybe it's the Philippines. Ah, it's Philippines. Sorry, I've got I've got my P I. That's, that's okay. That's up. acceptable. She, so she's banned from there for calling it a shithole or equivalent. The president of the Philippines banned Claire Danes from entering the country after she di- disparaged the country's capital. In an interview with Vogue magazine, Danes described Manila as a ghastly and weird city. <laughs> Uh, and then more recently, she was quoted in Premier magazine saying Manila smelled of cockroaches with rats all over. There's no sewage system and the people do not have anything. <laughs> no arms, no legs, <laughs> no eyes. Wow. Well, that, that, that sounds like she <laughs> has doubled, <laughs> tripled and quadrupled down. I bet a press officer was absolutely having kittens at that sort of... For uh... sakes, that's incredible. I mean, I've never been to Manila. No, but... I'm not going to now. It sounds horrible. No, no, put me right yeah. off. Anyway, number three, Body Shaking by 911. Okay, don't remember how that goes. And then, uh, well, we've got a, we've got a top, top two nonce fest here. Uh, number two, I Believe I Can Fly by R. Kelly. Mm-hmm. And then number one, Blood on the Dance Floor by Michael Jackson. Mm. Oh, so a sp- space jam tune in there as well. All right then, Russ, price me up. Prices were quite difficult again to find, so we've got do your best. some random nonsense all, here. All we ever can ask of you, Russ, is that you do your best. Loaf of white sliced bread, okay. 52 pence. Okay. Litre of unleaded petrol, mm-hmm. 60 pence. Pint of milk, 35 pence. Mm. A year's worth of electricity, £353.17. Mm. A year's worth of gas, mm-hmm. £385.71. Average house, 66521 pounds 66, 25 years ago, 66 grand. Yeah. Bloody hell. Mm-hmm. Six large eggs, 80 pence. And a pint of beer, £1.75. Well, we can definitely attest to that, can't we? And the Argos catalogue. Mm-hmm. Go on, Russell Hobbs. What is it? It isn't the Russell Hobbs. Oh, no. Those damned Dutch have swooped in, and it's the Phillips. Phillips have come in with an absolute doozy. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, well, even, yeah, even yeah, you yeah. are respecting what you're, uh, what they're offering up. It's, ne- it's, it's nearly twice the price of all the competitors, I've got to say. Cripes. It's, uh, it's the Phillips HD 4601 filter line pirouette stainless steel cordless oh kettle. Oh, my God. Max capacity, 1.7 litres. It's got the pirouette 360-degree connector yeah. for left or right-handed use. Brilliant. Polished stainless steel body and spout, locking lid, removable washable long life scale filter, neon power indicators visible from both sides. Very good. Concealed element for easy cleaning, three level safety system, non slip feet, pushing cord storage, BEAB approved 2200 watts. That will cost you £49.50. Cripes. Sixth of a weekly wage. Does sa- good Lord. Does sound pretty good though. Pretty sweet. Mm. So let's talk about the episode. It was a good one, but let's talk about it. Let's let, it. let's let's order it. Most important invention. I got so bogged down in the characters, I didn't even think about what the invention was. <laughs> to remind you and everyone else at home, there is the telepresence robot. There is the high altitude bed tube. There is the pen pal, the language translation device. The male contraceptive pill and deep blue, which probably is an invention. Now, I think that we can rule out the telepresence head. Yep. I think we can rule out... I don't know. I, I kind of feel like we can rule out the high-altitude bed because, like, it's... I'm sure it did what it did, but it was, it's quite hyper-focused on a specific thing. I'm just... I'm talking through my thinking here. I think we can rule out the male contraceptive field because there isn't one. And then Deep Blue... 
maybe because I suppose what I'm saying is I'm settling on the idea that the Krikshnery, the scanning translating pen, obviously as a specific individual invention is not necessarily brilliant. But what it has led to, I think, is more yeah. exciting and more interesting than anything else we've seen. Mm. Point counterpoint. Well, I just wonder yes. whether any of the inherent in te- any of the technology in that pen is new technology. If you see what I mean, is, is they have they not just combined two technologies? Is that not an invention though? But what I'm saying is, that even if that pen had not been yeah. invented, we would still have the translating equipment we still we have because. That, okay, that, I see. Yeah, I see. There's what you're nothing saying. inherent yeah, in that yeah, pen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it, it, it's not the Rosetta Stone of. <laughs> that's a bad example. It's it's not the. Uh, it's it's yeah. Okay, I I understand what you're saying. That's fair enough. I I, I respect that, Russ. So then, in that case, what is the most important invention we've seen today? <laughs> uh... Point counterpoint <laughs> counter counterpoint. <laughs> the, the the bow tie with the casual <laughs> shirt. <laughs> that's a hard no from me, I'm afraid. In that one. Yeah. Oh, uh, the condom themed restaurant. Do, uh, do you know what? That popped into my head as well. That idea of, um, yeah, go on then, fuck it. <laughs> Cabbages and condom <laughs> restaurant. Yeah, it's absolutely it's an unmitigated success. The most worthless invention. Telepresence robot? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, isn't it? Because we don't have them. Certainly his version it's, has it's no future. It's not, it's, yeah. not, it's not like, the, like the, the male pill has a future. Obviously, the particular solution they were proffering 25 years ago didn't amount to much. But they're talking about the male contraceptive pill, and actually that's <laughs> still to come. Most inaccurate prediction of the future. Probably the male contraceptive uh, pill, isn't it? I don't know whether it's a prediction of the future, but sitting in a meeting wearing, oh. that, wearing that, those eye gla- glasses. Yeah. Two places two at places once. Two places at once. That's... It's not good, is it? Two places at once, because that is such a huge sell. That idea that you could, because like it's it's very clear that Shanaz's script is suggesting that you will be able to do both at once. Like you will be able to attend your work meeting and attend your child's tennis match and not drop the ball. And that mm. is obviously impossible. And it is absolutely hindered <laughs> by attaching a <laughs> VR helmet to your head. And no doubt the sound of the, the, the rotor, the, you know, the, the motors and the, all the engineering in that robot, that's going to put your daughter off her swing. Completely agree. Also, at the end there, Howard does predict that Kasparov is going to beat Oh, he does. <laughs> oh, well, scrap what we were saying. I mean, that's a, that's a literal <laughs> prediction of the future that's that is entirely inaccurate. <laughs> and it was only a week away. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Well remembered. Um, sorry, Howard. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we do like you, but, you know, you were wrong in that one. But to be fair, he, he does say narrowly things Gary will, will win. We're screwed by a presenter. I don't know. We can't. We can't do the same thing twice. So the Shanna's booking her meeting. Oh, at the Shana's. same time as her daughter's. Yeah. her daughter's tennis. I, th- I don't think I said at the time. It's nice to see Shanna's having a bit of fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? The whole yeah. thing is. She even does a kind of a... In the previous episode, in the previous episode, she had to like just talk to some poor ill woman, and it was all very serious. It was very serious. Yeah. Whereas here, she's having a bit of a laugh. It... Yeah, no, she she even kind of pull. I don't think we said, but like she even pulls like a kind of a Kevin McAllister yeah. Home Alone face as she realizes she's she's uh, double booked. Uh, great show, I love it. Best attempt at making something boring interesting. I think they managed to make everything. Interesting I think I in this episode. totally agree I with was, you. I was entertained from start to finish. Yep. So it's just a case of picking whatever the most boring thing is, I guess. Well, we don't have to answer it. Artie Ziff's shirt. He managed to make that interesting, didn't he? <laughs> what, what would be? That's, that's that's it. That's the answer. <laughs> Quite a boring, a very boring polo, shirt. polo <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> really, really zhuzhed yeah, up. Yeah. Or, or 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 that old man's head in the market. <laughs> he really made that. <laughs> he really made that ensemble interesting as well. It's, it would, that Smurf it's hat. certainly a head I I would remember. <laughs> I no, I think the Artie Ziff uh, t-shirt is a great is a great answer. Best use of music. Two two songs. Uh, uh, played that we well i just prefer the new order yeah, yeah. song and i think it goes better with the robot thing and it, it's not necessarily a robotic song but it's no so truth truth faith 94 by new order or the other one then was sting mad about you and it's like well it's going to be new order every day isn't it best or worst use of furniture the bed starring philippa absolutely yeah 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 yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. great great bit of furniture yeah <laughs> dirty boy <laughs> Most notable clothing. And now this, this, I never in my life thought that this I mean, would be this the is... most fought over because we have three. This is like the rumble in the jungle. This is, this is, this is absolute. We have three items. How we, how, yeah. So we have 
I'm knocking out Eagles cowboy hat. Oh, okay. Why is that? First, because I just think the bow tie just trumps it. Okay, okay, I love it. So All right. I think I think it's I think it's a mono a mono between bow tie and market hat. That the hat and Shepherd's Bush market yeah. hat. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's I think that's where the real challenge lies. I tell you why I'm going to go with the market hat. Yeah. I tell you why. Arch- because he wasn't involved in a cycling doping scandal. <laughs> well, you know, we don't know that. <laughs> We don't know what that guy has and has not done in his life. So it'd be wrong <laughs> to assume he's completely innocent of anything. I'll tell you why I'm going to well, go... He's, definitely, he's not going to be pregnant. We know that. <laughs> he's de- or get anyone else. He's, all we know is he's not getting any. I'll tell you why I'll go with his hat. Because Dr. Archie woke up that morning, decided he wanted to impress the BBC or take the piss, and he put on mm. that self tie bow tie. That was a deliberate yeah. act because he knew he was going to be on TV. The guy with a hat in the market, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he yeah. just wore that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, good that's reason, just yeah. that's just his hat. <laughs> <laughs> He's got nothing of putting that that's on. Just, that is yeah, not affected yeah, that's, in that's, any way whatsoever. That's his Wednesday morning market hat. I think you're right. right. That's that's excellent reasoning, Thank Mark. You. I absolutely got it on that. Yeah. Did we see anything in the episode that made it through to the future? It was quite a lot. Yeah. yeah, I think not specific things. Obviously, telepresence. The telepresence robot Heed has not made it through. But telepresence as a yeah, absolutely. industry yeah. is still a, a thing that they're pursuing. Yeah, correct. As we as we move our heads around. Yeah. <laughs> in a way, is that robot good silent, enough? Silent. Yeah, but I was yeah. just impressed by how silent we, whisper the quiet, move my head yeah. around. I'm not even sure these... Well, whisper quiet neck. I'm not even sure these microphones can pick up the whisper quiet <laughs> necks that we have. <laughs> the translation pen doesn't make it through. Well, no, actually, that's not true. Like, you literally... Yeah, like I literally you saw the... Li- yeah. If you, if you sub lunatic yeah. with far too much money, so that, you can still find That's one. made it through. Well done. I'm assuming there are um, uh, hyperbaric... Well, no, there's a house. There's a whole house. That's there's a high yeah, yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But obviously, as I said, that the offshoot of his the bubble yes. was that that bag he invented. Oh yeah, which, which is incredible. Was far, far, a far better out there, out there saving technology. lives, which is incredible. Yeah, shame it's named after a sex pest. <laughs> obviously, the male contraception, the contraceptive bill hasn't. Yeah, I mean, but cabbages it's on, it's and condoms well. has. Do we have any listeners in the uh, in the Oxfordshire slash Bister area? If you're listening to this and you've been to please, please, cabbage, and, can you please? Yeah, or... absolutely. We would love to know. We have listeners all over the place. Yeah. Actually, if you do, we have any listeners in the Philippines? Actually, I don't know if we do. We have a hundred countries or something like that have listened to us, but maybe not the Philippines. And yeah, chess and the chess computer, uh, Deep Blue and uh, IBM, they've all made it through. They've all made it through. And Gary Kasparov, yeah. luckily, didn't run for yeah. presidency. He's also still alive. So well done, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what does this episode tell us about the 30th of April, 1997? Well, it seems like great fun. It does, doesn't um, it? Cracking fun. Yeah. Uh, do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to struggle to make some kind of grand sweeping statement about what this episode tells us about this time, because obviously that, that's part of the fun, because it's a completely stupid question. And I'll tell you why, it's because we've seen next week's episode, which is awful. And so it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know what, you know, it's yeah. very, very, so that's, well, that's in the back the of my head. I, I always think one of the great problems with looking back on history, especially mm. in a, like a, a sort of a popular way that the media does, is the idea that there's very easily definable epochs that you can just plug everything into. And I think probably what would have been perfect for that theory is if the last episode of the John Major government had been the other was one. that boring yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. that boring? If they were switched yeah. round, yeah, if yeah. it was that really Un- boring one, that we watched, grey, boring. And then suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly Tony Blair turns up and then it's this episode and yeah. it's great and it's really good fun and everyone's having a great time. But that's not what happened at all. No. It's the absolute reverse. It's nothing to do with the election. It's not at all. It's, Zero. The point is, yeah. like with most things, the whole world's random. It's just a you know, shot in the dark as to whether something yeah. comes out good or bad. Or But I do, I do think it does provide a good snapshot of... I think because of the inclusion of the Vox Pops in particular. Oh, that's brilliant, yeah. It's a great snapshot of society mm. in a way that we... The, I think the only other episode that we had it with was the, the, the town planning episode. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was Vox Pops from a similarly close to yeah. BBC TV set, the housing estate. Yep. And they were all really 70s... Well, well, actually quite 60s sort of people. They were very 60s, 70s. yeah. They were in their 70s, but they, they were from but the But I 60s, really enjoyed yeah. that as yeah, well. Yeah, that was another. That was a lovely nice little slice of life as well. I recently watched... The YouTube algorithm threw up a clip from RTE from, I think, 1985, 1986, and where there was, again, Vox Pops, and they were on the streets of Dublin, and they were asking people what they were giving up for Lent. And the reason I watched it was because I thought, well, actually, I I was alive. It wasn't that I was thinking, like, oh, maybe I'll see myself in. It's more like, I walked those streets at that time, and I nearly had a heart attack, Russ. It, that looked like the 60s. Every, you know, it was astonishingly <laughs> dated. It hurt. Yeah. It hurt. Physically hurt to watch. 
Uh, and that's ignoring the content, which was bizarre and swivel eyed. <laughs> and uh, it's just the, the idea that a national broadcaster would out, go out and ask people what they're doing for a kind of religious, what their religious commitment was for the year. It was astonishing. But oh, God, it looked awful. I mean, it was it was heartbreaking <laughs> to see that. Because like, I remember Dublin being this grand, amazing. I mean, it's, it is. It's a lovely place. But like in my head, because I was five, it's like I was, you know, three foot off the ground. It was this huge, magical land. Can't go back, thank God. <laughs> yeah, Vox Pops have a real... You're right. Their real value is not telling you things you don't care about now. It's looking back and seeing genuine people and how they lived and what they do. Yeah, this episode would have been good without it, but I think it's great with it. Let's move on to TW Tropes for us. We've got our checklist here. Presenter having to speak over louder noises. The closest we get is the telepresence robot, but I'm not convinced. Yeah. Is there anything? Is there anyone? Either that or the... There's the fella talking over the traffic when he's on the Vox Pop bit, but I think I think it's a no for me. It's a rare no. It's a the, rare no. I think that, that's, that's our most our most ticked trunk. Easily I think, I don't, it has I think to it's be a rare no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stanley Kubrick reference. Well, the uh, the rocket a hotel in the Rocky Mountains, mm. Mark. I thought it felt it were really they, reminding they are me definitely of... they are definitely at a hotel in the Rocky Mountains they are. and there's there's a Stanley Kubrick yes. film which is set in a hotel at the Rocky Mountains. Also, you know, Stanley yeah, Kubrick's that's... daughter was named Vivian, spelt in the same way. Also, Hal was based in an IBM computer, but I don't think any of these are I don't think any of these are direct references the way that they we haven't we've not had a good one for a while, I don't think. No. Something to do with oil rigs? Nothing to do with oil rigs. It's weird. It seems, it's almost like there's an oil rig cutoff point, isn't it? Somebody on... At some um, point in the late 80s, early 90s, they just cut off the oil rigs, you even know, though they still exist. They just don't talk about them anymore. I will give them a reference now, because I'll tell you what, only this week, somebody who's been listening to us commented on our Instagram posts. And Stephen Moore, thank you very much for commenting. From what I remember, Tomorrow's World of the 70s was all about North Sea Oil and Concord and then the Space Shuttle. And I, I, we haven't actually come across Concord at all. But what that made me then think is, when do they stop talking about oil rigs? When does that become not the thing of the future, or the present, but of the past? And it has to be sometime in the 80s. Suspiciously obvious brand names on the ad-free BBC. We've had quite a few, not least the Coke can. Yeah. Delicious, refreshing can of Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. A lovely uh, spunk viewing Olympus microscope. Yep, exactly how uh, they advertised it. Clear and blatant lying. That dad saying um, it's about time men took responsibility for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> his wife immediately saw through. He was clearly lying in front of his wife, yep, wasn't he? Yeah, he I'm going with shit. that one. Clear and blatant lying. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Casual sexism? I can't recall anything. Except for, unfortunately, Dr. Yeah, Professor Igor <laughs> grab off. Well, what about what about Howard's suggestion that the pill is everything uh, that every man yeah. dreads and every woman wants? That's pretty... Pretty broad brush. It is. That's true. And it, it sexism there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you know, a bit of was it mindrogyny as well? Because in a sense, like it's it's a it's a bit of a dig on men, isn't it? It's also kind yeah. of, it is also kind of accurate though. <laughs> yeah, let's take it anyway. Lab space filled with darkness and coloured lights. Oh yeah, uh, big yes. I was yeah, delighted to see that. Those. Yeah, Dutch angle. I feel like there has to be one. No, but I don't remember seeing it. Um, it's it, we do it's keep a an perfect eye era for one. It's a yeah, perfect era absolutely. for one, but I didn't see one at all. Was there one during the tennis? Strangely. Action shots don't really the same. No. Was it, what about when was when Philippa was in the tube? Was no, she, that was, was level. There, but you could you could yeah. couldn't really tell because no, it was all it was round. <laughs> Item presented from the gantry. No. Dad joke. I was from a mountain. That's true, Russ. That's not what we're taking though. Nature's gantry. Nature. <laughs> Yeah, the smile on your face when you thought of that before you said it was brilliant. It's nature's gantry, Mark. It's nature's gantry. I mean, I, I mean, I'll tick it, but I'll untick it after we log off. Dad joke from Howard Stableford? Nothing really. I think the close. He makes a few humorous comments. He does. Though. Like yeah, he says, yeah, yeah. Um, "I'm keeping well out of that." Yeah. Um, uh, which is, which is quite right too. Yeah. You say anything during the t- chess bit? I don't remember anything. It's not, and it's not like we don't look. <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy to say no in that mm. one. Episode ends in a damn squib. No, 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 no quite well. I think they're all fairly equal, the segments. Yeah, I'd say so. Lasers and magnets. The pen clearly had a laser on it. When he scanned that pen yep. across the thing, saw the... it was definitely shining a laser on the page. Right. There we go. In Under the Wire, that's one of the lightest TW trope checklists we've had for quite a while. But that's the order done, Russ. This episode... Just demonstrates the rich variety. Yeah. The rich variety of this episode. God, we think we know this program, Russ. And every time it surprises <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, throws up a cheeky curveball. Then the only thing left to discuss is the outro. Oh, yes. When I first watched this, Mark, it's kind of... Well, it kind of freaked me out. Because 
I'm not really sure why I said it in the first episode, but I did. I signed off the program by saying see you tomorrow. And then you said, oh, that's quite a good way of signing off. So I've, I've always said it mm. at the end of every episode, even though it doesn't really make any sense. None whatsoever. Um, so but it's, it, it works. <laughs> yeah. So I was shocked when we watched this outro to find that <laughs> I've subconsciously been channeling Howard Stableford all this time. Looks like it's going to be a close contest. I think it will. My money's on Kasparov, just. Well, we'll see. Anyway, before we go, we just want to tell you about how you can spend even more time with us. Six weeks ago, we gave you the chance to see the programme, not just on the TV, but also on the internet. Well, the response was fantastic. Hundreds of thousands of you dropped in on our website to see live pictures of the Tomorrow's World exhibition in Birmingham. Well, starting from tomorrow, you'll be able to peek behind the scenes to see the programme being made. We'll be putting a roving internet camera in the studio, the editing suites and all around the office. The address is coming up. So, if you're on the internet, we'll see you tomorrow. Otherwise, same time, same place, next week. Good night. Good night. Well, when I first saw that clip, Russ, it, it, it near damn well blew my socks off. I was gobsmacked. Do I need to stop paying royalties to Howard <laughs> now, now that I know that I, I've used his original material? <laughs> his original. Pirated his original material. All, all, all <laughs> yeah. I know is that, as far as I'm concerned, from now on, you have to say, so if you're on the internet, we'll see you tomorrow. And then... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if I'm going to copy him, I'm going to copy I'm going to copy the full thing. Go big or go absolutely. home. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um... Well, I might as well say it now, mightn't I? There's nothing else for us to say. So, if you're on the internet, we will see you tomorrow. Bye.